right. They'll be here. Good evening and welcome to our December 14th school board meeting. This meeting is now in session. This meeting is now in session and I'd like to ask everyone to please rise for the presentation of the colors by the Career Center Air Force JROTC. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Thank you and, and welcome everyone again. I do want to remind you that we will be having remarks um, uh, in honor of Mr. Lander after we have a wonderful choral performance from Washington Lee High School as well as two brief recognitions. So we welcome you to please stay as we share those remarks. Um, it'll probably be about 30 minutes into our meeting. Uh, our first special treat this evening is a performance by the Washington Lee Chorus. Our visual and performing arts supervisor, Pam Farrell, will introduce the group. But first I would like to invite my colleagues um, to please join me in the front row so we can enjoy the performance. Thank you, members of the school board, executive leadership team, and guests. We are in for quite a treat this evening. I'm honored to introduce tonight's performance, the Washington Lee Madrigals, under the direction of Ms. Teresa Severin. They are here this evening to provide some winter cheer, and we'll let them get settled. Before they move to their holiday theme, we would like to recognize Mr. James Landers for his commitment and dedication to students throughout these past years. Through Mr. Landers' leadership, it has become a tradition for Arlington students to perform this next piece during a school board meeting in February in recognition of Black History Month. Tonight, the Washington Lee Chorus will perform one of Mr. Landers' favorites, Lift Every Voice, the Black American National Anthem. Please stand. Lift every voice and sing till the Sing, 
faces our God where we met thee. Bless our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand, true to our God, true to our native land. child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises We are daughters of dust and the sons of great visions. We're sisters of mercy and brothers of love. We are lovers of life and the builders of nations. We're seekers of truth and keepers of faith. We are makers of peace and the wisdom of ages. We are our grandmother's prayers and we are our grandfather's dreamings. Breath of our ancestors, we are the spirit of God. We are mothers of courage and fathers of time. We are daughters of dust and the sons of great visions. We are sisters of mercy and mothers of love. We are lovers of life and the builders of nations. We are seekers of truth and keepers of faith. We are makers of Let 
let it snow, snow, let it snow, let it snow, snow, let it snow. Oh, the weather outside is frightful, but the fire is so delightful. And since we know place to go, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. It doesn't show signs of stopping. And I brought some corn for popping. The lights are turned way down low. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. When we finally kiss goodnight, how I hate going out in the storm. But if you really hold me tight, all the way home I'll be warm. The fire is slowly dying. And my dear, we're still goodbying. But as long as you love me so, let it snow, let it snow. Oh, let it snow, snow, let it snow, let it snow, snow, let it snow, let it snow. do a quick picture with the magicals and Miss Severin thank you all so much for sharing your talent Maybe some of the uh, ladies can go up to the, to the little perch there <laughs> Grace go stand next to you Thomas here thank you all good to see you <laughs> All right, next we have two staff recognitions. Ms. Talento will present the first one to our budget staff in the Department of Finance and Management. Ms. Talento. I just want to make note, I don't know if I've ever been at a podium that actually lowers for me, so this is really <laughs> interesting way to speak publicly. Okay, so thank you all for being here this evening and thank you all for coming early to celebrate Mr. Lander's service to our community. Tonight, I'd like to represent the, uh, present the budget award recognition. I'd like to invite our Assistant Superintendent of Finance, Leslie Peterson, and her staff, Tamika Lovett-Miller, Alvira Wilson, and Jorge Velasquez to join me up at the podium, please. As Dr. Kennan mentioned, we are excited to recognize these great employees for their achievement in receiving the Association of School Business Officials International, or ASBO's Meritorious Budget Award for the 2017-2018 APS budget. We are even more excited to note that this is the ninth consecutive year that APS has received this award. Thank you so much for all of your hard work. The Meritorious Budget Award recognizes excellence in school budget presentation and is awarded to school districts whose budgets have undergone rigorous review by professional reviewers and have met or exceeded the ASBO's stringent criteria. School business officials are responsible for ensuring taxpayer dollars are spent wisely and that the district budget reflects students' priorities and needs. By receiving this award, the ASBO is confirming that APS has accessible, accurate budget that builds trust with our community and holds student at the center of our fiscal plan and vision. Congratulations, Leslie, Tamika, Alvira, and Jorge, and all of our finance staff for your great work. Now, well, yes, applause. 
and I'd like to invite my board colleagues to join us for a photo. Oh, we have a plaque. This is so exciting. Okay. So there is a problem. Um, I'm putting some pressure. We have three empty slots. So you've got to get us three more years, okay? And then we'll have a full plaque. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so thank you so much for your work. I want to present this plaque, and we'd like to have a picture. And if you want to stay towards the end of the meeting, we're going to have our closeout report, which is fascinating and just reflects the hard work. So if you want to join us tonight, we would be excited to have you through the night. One, one more brief recognition. I'd like to ask Mr. Goldstein to present um, the to recognize the APS staff's participation in the annual United Way campaign. Mr. Goldstein. Thank you. The United Way of the National Capital Area supports many families in our community. This year, the organization is focusing their efforts on supporting local families in the areas of education, health, and financial stability. APS is proud to participate in the United Way campaign and has been a supporter for many years. This year, our employees raised over $53,000 during the 20-day long campaign. Over 40 APS staff members, representing all schools and departments, served as coordinators throughout the campaign. And we want to thank them for their efforts and for taking on this important role. We also want to thank John Kutsuftikis, John Kutsuftikis, for providing leadership during the 2017-18 school year campaign. John's been a great volunteer and has served as the countywide coordinator for more than five years. And now I'd like to introduce Jeff Brown, public sector campaign manager for the United Way, who is here to acknowledge the role APS plays in its successes. I'm glad you said John's last name. I've been practicing it all week, and I still don't think I would have gotten it right. But John, I uh, wish he was here. He is the backbone of this campaign. Uh, he's there from coordinator training to yesterday when I picked up the last paper pledge forms uh, and every step in the way, reminding people, making sure the emails are out there and people are aware of this. So, so thank you, John. Um, as a proud parent of an Arlington Public School graduate, it is my pleasure and honor to be here today. Uh, my son Peter graduated from WNL and he also took full advantage of what the Career Center had to offer. Uh, in fact, the film and TV uh, class he took at the Career Center sparked a love of film uh, that now he's a senior at North Carolina School of the Arts studying film studies and about ready to graduate. So, uh, and then Peter, he, he knows I go out this time of year and make a lot of speeches and he's always interested, where, where are you going? And when I told him I was coming here, a room where uh, he and his classmates were honored for coming in first at Skills USA and, and TV stuff. He was really excited. He asked, what am I going to say? And I told him. And he said, well, mention this. And I wrote it down because uh, I wanted to make sure I got it correct. He said, make sure you emphasize your appreciation of not only the programs, but the staff as well. They are incredibly dedicated and passionate about the students. And coming from a former student, that is sentiment you all should be very, very proud of. And also something you should be very proud of is the generosity of your employees. Because this year, $55,000 was raised thanks to that generosity, that compassion, that caring about our community. And because of that, organizations, local organizations here like Arlington Thrive, Doorways for Women and uh, families in the Arlington Food Assistance Center are going to get help and people in our community are going to get help. So um, it is a great honor to be able to present this plaque here. Let me, I forgot to bring it up here. And it reads, in appreciation of your valued commitment and service to our community, Arlington Public Schools 2016-2017 corporate partner. Thank you very much, all of you, for your generosity. Thank you very much for your leadership. And I think, oh, thank you, sir. Okay. We're going to.
We're going to take a photo. Um, I just want to share a fun fact. My son Fred was on that team with Peter that won the award. And Peter says hi to Fred. Yes. All right. Fred <laughs> says hi to Peter. So you should probably hold it this picture. Sure. Okay, as, as many of you know, and the reason many of you are, are here this evening is that it is Mr. Lander's last evening with us as a member of the school board. And we'd like to take a few moments to let all of our board colleagues share some words about Mr. Lander. We will start with Ms. Talento. It's always difficult, I think, to have to express your gratitude and, and thankfulness in words when words aren't enough. And so I want to say thank you for your public service over the last eight years to Arlington County. Being an elected official, as I now know, is something that requires a lot of fortitude, thick skin, dedication, commitment. We get praised and thanked. We also get bullied and insulted. We get thrown under the bus. We get trashed. But yet we are still supposed to come to work every day and smile and say, we're going to do everything we can for your student. And Mr. Lander has done that since the day I met him. It doesn't matter what is happening outside in the community, how difficult the decisions that he has to make are. It doesn't matter how people are praising him or insulting him, thanking him or telling him to change his mind, gosh darn it. He comes here and he thinks about what is best for the students in Arlington County. He has been an example for me, and I appreciate that. I will take that with me during my time as public service, and I hope that I can count on you for your wisdom, your ability to take me out of the weeds, and show me things that are really achieving our goal, and understanding that we should always focus on the safety and what is best for our students. Thank you, Mr. Lander, for your service. I am truly grateful to know you and to have worked alongside you. Mr. Goldstein. Thank you. Um, James and I met years, years before uh, either of us were on the school board. And in fact, um, we worked together uh, at a, a company in the private sector, uh, again, years before um, either of us, or of course he was on the board before I was, but even before that. So uh, we go back quite a ways and in different uh, roles. Um, I have always been, and I'm extremely grateful for, being a beneficiary of his support, his guidance, and his sage advice. And it, since being on the board for the last two years, I have been particularly impressed by his thoughtfulness when we have to discuss a variety of you know difficult topics. Um, James always brings not just the maturity of the years that he has spent on the board and thinking about this, but uh, a very personal thoughtfulness to all of our discussions, and and that's always struck me. And I certainly hope that I'll be able to um, continue to connect with him and rely on him for. Um, that level of thoughtfulness as I hopefully one day, you know, mature to the level that he's at. So um, I, I hope you're not going to be a stranger. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Ms. Van Dorn. Okay. Thank you for your years of service on the board, Mr. Lander. 
to the community and most importantly to the children of Arlington, this is gonna be hard. It's a rare place that I go in this community where somebody doesn't, if I'm with you, doesn't come up to you, especially young people, and they wanna talk to you and they wanna learn from you. And I see that every time I'm anywhere with you in the community, you've touched a lot of hearts and a lot of children. You were chair of the board in my first year on the board and you provided me with endless time and patience in coaching me on how to be a board member. And I am the board member I am because of you. And I appreciate that. I had so much to learn. I continue to have so much to learn. But your patience and your wisdom is, is just greatly, greatly appreciated by me and by, I think, every member of this community. Um, just yesterday, we were working on our middle school boundary motion, and we all have lots of different thoughts, and we're trying to pull it together. And as always, uh, Mr. Lander just sees the shortest path and the most succinct way and weighs in with that wisdom, and I'm going to miss that. It, you always get us to the essence, and we may work on from there, but you get us to the essence, and I, I really appreciate that and appreciate your mentorship. I wanna also thank Kirsten and Monica for sharing you with us and sharing so many hours of your time as well as the rest of your family. Um, the last thing I'll say is that I have a bit of a mantra that I live by, and I think that James and I share this. And I can say that in every path I've walked with you, uh, every moment that we've worked together, we've done this in the same light, and that is that we go out into the world in peace, we have courage, we hold fast to what is good, returning no one evil for evil. I've never seen you ever respond in that way. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering honoring all people. Love and serving the Lord your God and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. That is who you are, and it's been just a blessing to work with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I can't wait to see what your next chapter brings. I'd like to ask our superintendent, Dr. Murphy, would you like to say a few words? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Well, James, um, actually, I started just shortly before you joined the board, and um, so we've had a lot of experience and time together, and I've, I've always appreciated um, the interaction we've had and, and some of the phrases that you've coined, uh, and the most affectionate one is uh, one we would often talk, you would say, now, I, I just want to share this with you, but I know I'm clearly out of my swim lane. And um, I, I've always appreciated that. You would always you know, state your piece and let you know where the roles and responsibilities lie. Uh, but that is, a, that is a phrase I think that will stick with all of us and I think it's uh, most appropriate. I think you've also pushed us, and I appreciate that, to have the longer term vision. When you and I joined, this school division was less than 20,000 students. Uh, it has achieved the mark of 27, over 27,000 students today, and it is going to continue to grow. And I think you've kind of looked out on the horizon and said, how are we going to be prepared when this is a 30,000 school division, and what things do we need to have in place? And a lot of the things that we're putting in motion today are a result of you pushing us and forecasting ahead. I also uh, know that I thoroughly enjoyed when you were chair. Uh, we had some challenging budget times, and you stood fast. Uh, you stood fast, and as I like to say, you stood in the box and didn't waver. Uh, and as a result of that, I think you have been a tremendous financial steward and also leader for us. And as a result, uh, we are where we are uh, because of your efforts and your energy. And then finally, your colleagues have shared this as well, but I think um, you recognize equity for all, and I don't uh, speak to just students, but staff and our community, and I think that's kind of been a shining beacon uh, with all of your work, and it's reflected in the many things that you've done. So I'm appreciative of that, as Mr. Goldstein said. I know and uh, want you to stay involved and connected because you are a huge asset to our community, and it has been a pleasure working with you, and I know that I will work with you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you.
So, Mr. Lander, you know that I would talk all about our mutual love of the Washington Nationals if I could, but the problem is I have to give you the last word, right, so right, right, I, can't, right. uh, I can't do that. So I, I do want to say um, you were the chair when I joined the board as well, and you were welcoming, um, always fair, and ran a no-drama board that I very much have appreciated and have truly tried to emulate. Um, so you're a real role model to uh, the chairs of this board. You have been a tremendous advocate, and I promise you that this board will not forget your advocacy. You will always be here. We will always speak for your advocacy as we continue forward with this work. Now you know that I am going to talk a little bit about your, our, our, our mutual love of sports teams, none of whom are the same. Um, and so I did look up today how the Eagles are doing. Mm. And I, and I found that they're doing quite well and that they have a one in 10 chance of winning the Super Bowl. So um, I do want to let you know that we on this board will be cheering for the Eagles <laughs> all the way, all the way. And we're really looking forward to high-fiving you okay. about their victory when it happens in February. Uh, so truly, that's gonna, I, we will do that. We will, we will celebrate together. Yeah. And, um, a small token of appreciation from the school board. We'd like to share this gift with you. And if you would like to share any thoughts yes, with us, yes, now's yes. the time. Thank you. Eagles fight song, but uh, uh, our quarterback is out for the season, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go there. Uh, and, and I want to say uh, la cheeserie to all my little friends out there. And I uh, want to thank Mr. Cousy and, and Miss Grace. They, uh, they keep and maintain this building. Uh, they keep and maintain our safety when, when we're here late at night. And uh, I really appreciate them for all their efforts. I want to thank Melanie for uh, keeping the schedule of all five board members, including myself. And uh, since I've been on board, we've worked with uh, nine different board members. So there's always competing schedules. We've had as little as three board members and, and, and various numbers along the way. Uh, I want to thank everyone, and I, and I did get a chance when the reception was about to end to thank so many people for coming out and making the time through the traffic in the dark to be here with me this evening. Um, former board members, uh, Frank Wilson, uh, Libby Garvey, who is now on the county board, of course, and uh, Mary Hines were here earlier. I see Dr. Miguel and Sanchez, uh, Emma is here, and I sincerely appreciate you making time and coming, my friend. Um, buenas noches. Uh, Walter Tejada and his wife Wildman are here. Thank you so very much. Um, Jay Fassett was here earlier, and I just want to acknowledge, and Christian Dorsey, yes, and Christian was, and who else? No, Mary was here. Yeah, I said Mary. And, and, and I want to acknowledge um, uh, the elected officials um, uh, for making the time, because uh, when I first came into Arlington Public Schools as a parent, uh, Libby Gary was the first board member that I met, and through her and Frank Wilson, uh, I learned about Arlington as a community, and I learned about what it meant to be a citizen activist in this community. And uh, a lot has changed over the years, but as uh, Dr. Murphy referenced, we've grown as a school system. And so um, uh, uh, Mary gave me some wise words because we so focus as parents and as, as individuals, as professionals, on uh, what we didn't get done and what the next task is. Uh, she, she told me to take time to remember all that we've accomplished. And uh, when I sat back and thought about what we've done over the past 
um, eight years is, is really amazing. And uh, it leads me to, to the comments I want to make now. Um, all that we've accomplished and I've been a part of has been because of our educators, our senior staff, and our administrators and our teachers, our bus drivers, our food service, service folks. And uh, the buildings will be erected, be torn down, get moved around, boundaries, all of those things will come and go. But the relationships that um, uh, remain have been the ones that I've been able to establish with all the principals and teachers and administrators and the folks in the school system who take care of our children for eight plus hours a day. And uh, I, I can't uh, thank you guys enough when I think about um, the time you spend away from your own families, your own children, uh, given to ours. And um, uh, as parents, we've all been to school, and in Arlington, some of us has been to school uh, many times in many degrees. And so we think we're experts in education, and then we realize that we're not. Uh, you guys are, you, you, you are, um, it is amazing, and, and, and I, I, I've told this story before. Um, my daughter went to Wakefield, graduated. Uh, uh, Chris Warmore at the time was the assistant principal, and Doris Jackson was the principal. And we had a program where our st students could go to Costa Rica as part of the immersion program for two weeks. And this is public school, and it cost me just a plane ticket, cost of a plane ticket to send my daughter to Costa Rica. And I thought this was amazing. And after she graduated from Wakefield, graduated from college, she went away to Spain for a year. And when we went to visit her, I could see her navigate the metro, the metro system or the public transportation system in Madrid, speaking fluent Spanish. And that was a result of the education and the experiences she had in Arlington Public School. And there is no prouder moment that I've experienced as a parent is watching your child grow up. And it was amazing because she could read the signs, she could catch the language, because you know they speak so fast. And, 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 and she was immersed in the culture and it was just, it was amazing. And I credit that to the education that she got here. And so um, I, I can't express my thanks enough for the work that um, the staff in, in Arlington um, has put forward. I, I wanna thank all the executive leadership team. This team looks very different from the team we had uh, when I first started, but all the long hours that you put in is sincerely appreciated. I really do believe in the work that you're doing and I think that you guys have done a great job. We've had a number of changes over the years and I sincerely thank you for all the work that you put in and the relationships that we've built along the way. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, they talk about as being a good leader is hiring good people and getting out of the way. And so I hope as we move forward, we will give you the leeway to make good decisions and to carry us forward. And um, I hope that I can continue to be uh, of service in some way. Uh, like I said, the principals and the educators in Arlington are the key to our success. When I go to other districts and I talk to um, uh, other parents, the issues that they're having in other school systems um, are different than ours. That doesn't minimize the issues that we have here, but they're just different. Um, being able to provide uh, personalized devices to students, being able to pro provide access to museums and for PTAs to subsidize um, supplies for teachers that they want. Those are things and resources that other school systems don't have access to. So um, I am have been a success and I contribute that, I, I attributed that success directly to the work that our, our staff has done in Arlington. So um, the relationships is what I walk away with the most. And um, um, I remember when I was uh, about to become chair, uh, Reverend Hamlet in, 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 in my church family over at Macedonia Baptist Church uh, prayed for me that I would be successful. And uh, I was, so I, uh, that was a blessing and, and I credit it to faith. Um, I've, gr I've grown and, and whether I was serving my country in the Navy or, or serving my community, I actually, do, uh, actually really enjoy service um, 
in some form or another. So I will continue to do that. I will be active. Hopefully, as I said, um, uh, the administrators will uh, still answer my calls after January. And I look forward to sending emails to my colleagues advocating for something. Emma does that every now and then. So we want to advocate for something. It puts you in a different role. Uh, I will get my evenings back uh, in some form or another. But um, I, I sincerely just want to say thank you. Um, I, I'm tempted always to start naming names. But if I do, I will forget someone. Please uh, know that that is a, a reflection of my head, not my heart. And so uh, I, I just really want to say thank you sincerely to all of the, uh, the staff at APS because I, I just it is amazing um, what we are able to accomplish in Arlington through you, uh, whether it be special ed or minority achievement um, or uh, uh, Esau Hill. I mean, there's been so many programs, immersion, that I see benefit career and technical education, the Career Center is growing. It's just so much that I am so proud to call Arlington my home and be a part of such an active community. So I am going to continue to say thank you between now and the end of the year, and hopefully I'll touch base with everyone. I want to thank again the one person I will thank by name is, is Reverend Hamlin. Thank you for continuing to pray for me and keep me in, in prayer because um, I continue to need it. So please, <laughs> please, please don't stop praying for me now. So uh, we have a long way to go. We have many work to do. I am looking forward to the discussion on the boundary uh, decision. And just so you know, in Arlington, having a farewell uh, uh, reception doesn't mean that parents have had a number of text messages today telling me how I should vote on this. So I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate the advice. And um, uh, I, uh, there's one staff member that left one of my buddies, Erin Wellsmith. I want to recognize her and her help. Uh, she's helping me with my next transition, so I appreciate all her efforts, and hopefully her and Dr. Murphy will let me be a part of the recruitment fair that they have every year so I can continue to be uh, in market Arlington Public Schools to those who do not know how great this school system is and the work that you do. We're not perfect, but as, as Reverend Hammond says in church, we're not what we used to be. So we're not all we going to be, but we're not what we used to be. So, so uh, thank you all sincerely for your time, your talents, and your treasure. Um, uh, as, as, as one board member, I, I think you are amazing. And, um, and if you do something for me, that's great, but you have done marvelous things for my daughter, so I can't thank you enough. Oh, and, and maybe sure, let me make sure I thank my th family, um, of course. And, and <laughs> hey, listen, if, if, if it wasn't for my daughter, I really wouldn't be sitting here. So she, she changed me from a, a, a sailor and a single guy to a parent who has responsibility. So I want to thank her because, um, you know, if I didn't have a kid, I really wouldn't be here. So um, <laughs> she, she's the reason why I'm here and the reason why I'm serving. So again, thank you all sincerely. I really sincerely appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lander and everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. This does conclude our celebration of Mr. Lander. However, he's going to be with us for the next several hours as we, um, <laughs> as we continue with our agenda. Um, as Ms. Talento indicated earlier, we think we have very exciting meetings and we would love to have you stay. However, we understand some of you may wish to leave at this point. Um, we do ask you to please refrain from speaking until you get out the door so we can continue on with our meeting. But thank you all so much for coming, those of you who are leaving. And I'd like to ask Dr. Murphy to come up and begin announcements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I begin with my announcements this evening, I just want to uh, roll the uh, tape back for a moment on our uh, United Way campaign. And while we recognized uh, John Kusapikas out at Nottingham Elementary. I also want to uh, recognize a member of my team, uh, Ms. Cynthia Johnson, 
Uh, Ms. Tia Johnson plays a pivotal role at the central office in networking with uh, Mr. Kusifikas with the United Way campaign. So congratulations again. Uh, good, uh, you know, good achievement and good giving. And so I wanted to uh, make sure that you were uh, recognized for being a part of that. So we've got a couple of things coming up here and uh, reminders. The first is our uh, collaboration uh, with the county and the schools with the Martin Luther King Jr. Literary and Visual Arts Contest. Uh, and this year's uh, students uh, are contributing uh, both uh, with works of art as well as their writing about um, Dr. King's roots and making a connection to their lives. Uh, we are gathering entries and we're wrapping this up actually tomorrow at 5 p.m. And I want to thank all of our schools because we, for the last several years, have had 100% uh, participation across all of our schools. So there's great enthusiasm around this as well as the uh, PTA Reflections Contest, which comes up a little bit after the first of the year. Uh, Dr. Christy Murphy and her team have pushed out um, input for the calendar for the coming school year. So you've got one more week if you've got thoughts and ideas. We're doing the process a little bit differently than we've done it in the past, and there are some calendars that you can actually see uh, and reflect on and make some choices. And this was the result of her pulling a committee together to come up with uh, the, di the different variations or the different ideas that are reflected with on the survey. So we encourage uh, some feedback there with that. We continue to have open our application process for school options and transfers, and that goes through January the 19th. Currently, the schools that are open or options that are open include HB Woodlawn, Arlington Tech, uh, the Wakefield AP Capstone, and Washington Lee IB programs. I do want to make note that we went with an online application this year, and we've had already 500 folks uh, apply, so that is wonderful. The online option appears to be working, but if you don't have online access, you can either go to visit uh, the SciFax Welcome Center and they can help you walk through that process or you can go to your local school where your children currently go to school and they can also uh, provide some support there with that. Also, high schools currently that are open to transfers include Wakefield and Yorktown. And then once the board has made a decision this evening on middle school boundaries, we're going to revisit middle school uh, transfers and see what schools will be open and we'll be making an announcement in regards to that. We enjoyed this evening a uh, performance from uh, the Washington Lee Choral Group. There are a number of uh, performances going on uh, the remainder of this week and into next week. And so we want to encourage citizens to come out, especially those senior citizens. You can access to free admission card. Uh, there's the information there, or you can simply go to the school's our, uh, APS website and uh, learn what the uh, calendar is for performances, coupled with uh, how you can get a free admission ticket. We all know because of uh, the winter arriving uh, that uh, illnesses uh, sort of uh, proliferate at this time of the year. So just some you know, common uh, things that we want to emphasize and highlight. Uh, one being, just get plenty of rest. Also, uh, you want to make sure when you cover up if you're coughing. Washing hands uh, regularly also is a good measure. And uh, I know this one's tough for me. Sometimes if we're not feeling well, uh, the best medicine for us and those in, uh, that surround us in our work on a day-to-day -day basis is to stay home and get plenty of rest. And I know sometimes for many of us that may be tough to do. If you learn uh, that your children do have, um, are contagious, we ask that you just simply call the school clinic, let them know um, so that we can just have an, a general awareness. And I know our schools also push out a variety of different information when there is sickness or illness uh, at a particular school or work location. Reminder also, uh, winter weather uh, is upon us, so we are watching this very closely. Mr. Chadwick and Ms. Ertis are very diligent. Last night I was fortunate I did not get a phone call at 4 a.m. in the morning as uh, the weather did not s decide to arrive here, so uh, we were fortunate of that. But over the weekend, as many of you know, we did have some snow, uh, and we were very careful to watch how that all occurs. Just to let you know, we uh, try and make a decision by 4.30. It takes about 30 minutes for that information to get out. 
So if we elect to either delay or close because of inclement weather, those uh, announcements will be up by 5 a.m. If for uh, some reason uh, inclement weather arrives during the school day, we like to make a dismissal announcement by 11 a.m. That gives parents an opportunity to make some plans. And the other piece that I'll just emphasize or highlight is you may want to think about family plans if in the event that we are closed or there is a delay or, in fact, uh, we have to close early. So uh, this is just kind of a preemptive, uh, you know, acknowledgement of some of the things that we may be facing with the weather here as we uh, move into the winter months. We go through school here until next Thursday, December the 21st. Uh, and then we will be on winter break through January the 1st, and we'll return on Tuesday, January the 2nd. Uh, you can also see there are a number of activities coming up from, uh, I mentioned the CCPTA reflection event. There's a snow date for January the 18th. We've got some early release. We've also got the Martin Luther King holiday there on January 15th. We are halfway through the second quarter as of next Thursday. And when we come back uh, and we reach the end of the month in January, we'll be mid the midpoint in this current school year. And then we have a grade prep day on January the 26th. I want to credit um, Mary Beth McCormick. She is a counselor out at one of our elementary schools, actually Nottingham Elementary School. One of the themes going into this school year that I wanted to share, and I know many of our schools are kind of continuing to carry this message, is the whole idea around respect and caring uh, and understanding. And so uh, Mary Beth McCormick, or Dr. McCormick, had pushed out some social media about various children's books about gratitude and respect and understanding. And so I read that, uh, read that particular tweet, and I was intrigued. And so I um, asked Teresa Flynn, our uh, librarian specialist, to kind of gather up some of these books for me uh, to see what nuggets may exist in them. And in this particular book, uh, it's titled Thanks a Million. And I wanted to uh, just share this particular excerpt from the, uh, this book. And it's really about reward and saying thank you. Uh, and I think you've heard uh, that echoed here uh, this evening, uh, the idea of saying thank you about the gratitude uh, that we all get from, uh, you know, recognizing others as well as, um, you know, seeing things uh, come to really full bloom or flu uh, full, uh, tr um, tr full bloom, I guess, and uh, fruition. Thank you. Thank you. So to our parents and our communities and our volunteers, uh, at this time of the year, I want to say thank you. And also to our staff uh, and to our teachers and to uh, members of the APS team, I also want to say thank you. It's, um, you know, we are very fortunate, as has been mentioned uh, many times this evening. Um, but I think we need to carry that message and also carry that recognition. And I think this evening, um, the, you know, the little excerpt that I have here from the book, Thanks a Million, kind of echoes that. And I especially want to thank our teachers and our schools for threading this message. When you go into our schools, you see this message on bulletin boards, in pictures, in things that students are doing. And I think that's very, very powerful. The one that kind of echoes with me is one that sits right outside the office at Williamsburg. And it says, act like a proton, be positive. So <laughs> everyone have a wonderful winter break. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Sure. Uh, board colleagues, any additional comments? Hearing none, we will move. Yes? Uh, Mr. Goldstein. Want, want to make a fast uh, announcement? And um, I don't know if it's an announcement as much as a shout out. I had dinner tonight at uh, Off the Pike. The, uh, the restaurant that's uh, put on by the culinary arts students at uh, the Career Center. Um, I, I did have, I, I had something there uh, in the past. No, no, in the past. I was there before, but I don't think it was for dinner. But anyway, I was determined to make it to dinner uh, because I, I know they're doing a really great job. It was fantastic. The food was excellent, just really excellent and cost-effective. 
And so I just want to get that out there. How was the service, Mr. Goldstein? Uh, the service is very good. Excellent. Good uh, to although, hear. you know, when you only open, you know, once every couple of months, it's hard to, you know, get the, the rhythm, get the flow. But, you know, it's good. Um, so I urge everybody to next time they, they sponsor this to, to get over there and, and get some dinner. And it was very well attended. Very, very well attended. So I was, I was really happy and I wanted to share that. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you. Let's move on to our consent agenda. May I have a motion to adopt the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes five to zero. I do have several announcements I'd like to make um, as we just passed that consent agenda. Um, first, as part of that, we appointed a chair and vice chair to our advisory committee on transportation choices. Unfortunately, neither of them could be here this evening, but we have Mr. John Armstrong, who will be the chair. He's been a member of ACTC this year. He's also a member of the Pedestrian Advisory Committee, second vice president of the Lion Village Citizens Association, and he's a parent of Key and Gunston Middle School students. We're very happy to have him stepping up to serve as chair of that committee. Yanith Valenzuela, who was here until just moments ago, and unfortunately it looks like she had to leave, is going to be the vice chair of the ACTC. Her bio is extensive. Um, I had the pleasure of working with her on the Whole Child Working Group as well as the South Arlington Working Group. She has served on the Carlin Springs, Kenmore, and Washington Lee PTAs, is currently president of the Hispanic Parents Group for both Kenmore and Washington Lee. Um, in 2009, she was recognized as an honored citizen by APS, and there are even things that I never knew about her. She's a member of the Advisory Committee on Immigration, the board of her condominium, and she manages a travel soccer team. So that is a very, very busy parent, and we're very happy to have her stepping up um, to be vice chair of this uh, committee. We also appointed several members, additional members of the Career Center Working Group. Most of them were appointed at our last meeting, but we had some additional appointments to make. And finally, we adopted two briefing reports, as I've mentioned before, um, to keep our meetings as efficient as possible. Um, on some topics, we see them only every other year as actual presentations, and we get briefing reports um, in the off years. Just want to mention a couple things real quickly. One of them is about extended day. Um, these are both onboard docs that you'll be able to find them. Um, the big topic here is about space needs, that we, they were, extended day is most constrained by space. And um, so that's a very interesting read. And I also, since transportation is a major theme this year, just want to very quickly read um, the final section of this report. This is um, the APS Go briefing report. APS continues to grow along with the Arlington community as a whole. Strains on the school bus system have been evident. Growth in travel to school sites by car has led to congestion around schools and safety concerns around drop-off times have become particularly acute in many places. Survey results show that there are still barriers to walking, biking, and taking the school bus or transit for students and staff. The time has come to take a step back from the day-to-day -day challenges and review the school transportation system more holistically and as part of the greater countywide transportation system to integrate where possible and re-envision where necessary to provide better service more efficiently. Now that's a, a, a key goal that we all have, and um, the work is ongoing, but we're really excited about um, how that's proceeding. Okay, we will now hear citizen comment on non-agenda items. Ms. Elliott, do we have speakers? Yes, ma'am, we have three speakers tonight. Okay, um, as, as before you call the first speaker, I do want to review the speaker guidelines. The school board welcomes public comment. Generally, school board members do not respond to comments during the meetings. If they have not already signed up online, speakers must submit a speaker slip to the clerk before the agenda item they wish to speak on is called. Each speaker may speak for up to two minutes. There is a timer to help you keep track of the time, and speakers should conclude their remarks when the buzzer sounds. All comments should address a matter related to Arlington Public Schools. Speakers should be courteous and address their comments to the entire school board. Speakers are called in the order in which they sign up. If you have written comments, please give them to the clerk. We do ask the audience to refrain from applauding as it takes time away from the next speakers. And if you're in hearty agreement, you may want to make the knocking signal as demonstrated by the folks in the front row, um, which visually shows us that you're in agreement and we get a sense of that. Um, and we do ask speakers to please state their name when they begin. Ms. Elliott, would you like to call the first speaker, please? Yes. Our first speaker is Jeffrey Elkner.
distinguished members of the school board, superintendent, and staff. I've come here this evening to express my concern and the concern of the AEA about it, the negative impact that data gathering and testing as an end in itself can have on our educational program. CTE teachers were informed this year that we should give all of our students the workplace readiness skills for the Commonwealth examination, both the pretest and the test. This can, included all students, even those that had already earned a required industry certification or would be earning one in their CTE courses during the year. That means that each of the 349 students who so far took these tests at the Arlington Career Center alone missed two 90-minute class periods, which represents a combined 1,047 hours of missed opportunity to learn at a cost of $5,933. As an Arlington Public Schools IT teacher, I get to experience the tremendous joy each year of participating in an educational journey with my students, of watching them grow in their skills and confidence from the beginning of the educational year in September to its end in April. Yes, I said April, since by the last week in April, the season of learning grinds to a halt and the season of testing begins. SOLs, AP exams, WIDA tests, and others mean that I rarely have a full class from the last week of April until school ends six weeks later. Students with the greatest educational needs tend to spend the most time out testing since they are most likely not to pass the first time and to end up in a long cycle of remediation and retakes. That's why I jealously guard every minute of learning time granted me and resist as strongly as I can any increased incursion on the opportunity for my students to learn. I am puzzled by the push to require the additional workplace readiness test. Since we were asked to give both the pretest and the post-test, I can't help but think it has something to do with SMART goals. And if so, it is a serious case of the tail wagging the dog. We are turning both reason and common sense on its head Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our next speaker is Josh Fulb. My name is Josh Fulb. I'm speaking tonight as the parent of Michael, a fourth grader at Hoffman, Boston. I will spare 15 seconds to say thank you to Ms. Bullock, Ms. Marsicek, Ms. Spellman, and his first male teacher, Mr. Tavner, which he looks up to greatly. It's quite amazing to see the bond there. Chag Sameach Hanukkah as well. And here I go. It's 8 p.m. and I'm getting my son ready for bed and he realizes he has an assignment to do and the book is left at school. Now I know I'm not allowed to poll the audience on this one, so I'll ask the school board members, where do you go for that book? For the past years, it's been Blackboard. However, my understanding is that December 31st, Blackboard is being turned off, and almost none of the books have an availability to be moved to Canvas, with no expected date to move those books to Canvas. These materials, which APS paid for, we don't know when will be available again. So let me say it. Most books, textbooks, that APS has requested to be digitally will not be available on January 1. I have talked to teachers who are feverishly downloading material from textbook sections so they can use them later as they have no confidence APS will fulfill their promise of restoring access to textbooks before the end of the school year. I do not want my son's teachers wasting valuable time on such a trivial task. I asked the school board to find out two things. Why haven't the textbooks that APS has paid large sums to have as digital editions been transferred to Canvas? And what is APS going to do to get these books accessible on January 1st? On behalf of every parent who fears that last minute need for a book, thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker is Ingrid Gant. Good evening to Dr. Cannon and members of the school board and Dr. Murphy. Oh, thank you. Um, I am current the, a the current AEA president, and I just want to take a moment of personal privilege to just thank Mr. Lander for his service and dedication. I need you to understand that AEA has always seen you as a person who's remained calm in the storm. And even when we don't agree, we know that you've remained connected with us. When I reach out to you and we reach out to you, 
You haven't said no not one time under my term, and so we thank you for that. We are confident that you will remain steadfast and unmovable, for it does not yet appear what God has in store for you. So I personally want to thank you and to remind you that may the work that you've done speak for you. And I will leave you with the third verse that says, may the service that you give and that you gave speak for you. May the service that you've given speak for you. So when you've done the best that you could or you can, and your friends around you and near you just don't seem to understand, may the service you continue to give to APS speak for you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We will now move on to our monitoring items, and we have three monitoring items this evening. The first is the superintendent's update on the 2017-2018 action plan. Dr. Murphy. Yes, thank you again, Dr. Cannon. Let me uh, just give everyone a little bit of an update as far as where we are with our 2017-18 action plan. And I'm going to walk through all four of the categories and kind of identify uh, what things we've either accomplished or uh, what are some next steps. Uh, with new policy and policy revisions, uh, we are continuing to move forward with the school facility naming policy criteria, and you can see uh, some of the activities that we have accomplished. Right now, staff is engaged with a, a committee review, uh, and the intent is to bring forward in January a draft criteria to the school board um, that will begin to frame out what the policy will uh, begin to look like. Also, with acceptable use and the one-to-one -one devices, uh, we have uh, realigned the schedule here a little bit. Um, and um, moving forward, we are going to have a staff team here uh, during the remaining month of December take the five policies that we have related to technology and uh, blend those into two policies. One is related to technical procedures. The other is uh, tied to our acceptable use. In January and February, we're going to be bringing those back to the school board and also gathering community input. And then we're slated in March to take some school board action on both of those policies. Moving to group two, with prep for new schools and program moves, you're going to hear um, the board is prepared to take action this evening on middle school boundaries. Uh, you're also going to hear another monitoring item to follow this one on the Montessori move. And then we'll be coming af uh, back after the start of uh, the first of the year and begin the elementary school boundary process in January 2018. Moving to operational planning, we've been doing um, some uh, budget forums, uh, budget dialogues. I had the opportunity to go out to the uh, Civic Federation earlier this month with the county manager. Uh, and we're slated to uh, bring forward the proposed budget uh, on February the 22nd. We've also been working uh, with uh, the Strategic Planning Committee, uh, and they are mapping out currently a mission and vision, and there's some information up on Engage that we're looking for some input from folks. Our next committee meeting is next Thursday evening, uh, and we welcome also folks in the community to come out and listen. And then the second phase uh, for community input will start after the first of the year, and I know we also have a work session slated for the latter part of January with the strategic plan. And then finally, after the budget is adopted, we'll begin the capital improvement planning process, or the CIP. And then finally, for capital initiatives, uh, we've already initiated the, the Reed building. Uh, we've uh, kicked off the uh, Career Center Working Group, and I know they're going to be holding a meeting here after January the 1st. Uh, and then once the strategic plan is adopted, we'll be uh, focusing on the educational center and its instructional focus. Continue to turn everyone inward to engage uh, as a resource for updates, information, schedules, and calendar. Uh, it's a good resource. It's also an opportunity for you to provide input uh, and then also for us to uh, respond to that. So again, that has been very successful for us. And thank you for the folks in planning and school and community relations that are responding to a lot of that information. So that's just a quick update as far as where we are uh, with our action plan. A lot of this you're going to hear tonight with some of the agenda we have. Okay, thank you. Ms. Elliott, do we have speakers? There are no speakers. Board colleagues, do you have comments on this item? 
Ms. Van Dorn. I just have one comment on the acceptable use policy. I do hope that other advisory committees are involved in that. Uh, I know there's been discussion on the Advisory Council of Instruction as well as the Budget Advisory Committee. So I, I hope that it's not, that the, it is inclusive of other, uh, our other board advisory committees. Uh, yes, it is. I didn't, I, I didn't highlight there, but there's a lot of detail and we are going to kind of get some collective input on that. Okay. We will go to our second monitoring item, which is an update on our Montessori program. Dr. Murphy. All right, let me introduce uh, Dr. Natras, and I know Ms. Wendy Pilch is here. Uh, this is uh, one of the activities that we have going this year, and we want to give you an update as far as preparing for the Montessori move in uh, 2019, the fall of 2019. I do want to make note that this is uh, a recommending report in the sense of uh, this is input that we got from this group that we pulled together. Uh, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Natras and Ms. Pilch. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. And before I jump in, I also want to take the opportunity to say thank you to Mr. Lander. I didn't get to do that during the reception, um, so I'd like to take a minute and do that now. Thank you um, for your service and your time. Um, I am going to turn things over to Wendy Pilch, and I wanted to take a moment to thank her before I turn things over. She's actually been working on this with multiple community members and staff over the last several months and is going to share with you this evening the recommendations and the work from that particular group. So um, I will turn things over to Wendy, but wanted to say thank you um, to her and her team because they've done quite a bit of work over the last few months to bring these decisions forward to you, these recommendations. Thank you. And I will reiterate the thank you to Mr. Landers. And I also would like to thank Meg Tosillo for all the work she, um, she did providing guidance um, with this group. And feel free to chime in if there's anything that I'm missing. We worked over the past few months um, as a team with a variety of different members from retired teachers from Drew Models Montessori to Gunston Middle School Montessori teachers. We had administrators from both Gunston Montessori and are from Gunston and also from Drew Montessori, parents, community members. Um, we also had members of private Montessori programs attend and be part of our analysis team. We met several times um, through some late evenings, uh, started with looking at what the hopes and dreams for Montessori were and looked at some of the instructional impact research as the team looked at what the impact of combining different grades would look like. We did have some help from facilities looking at the capacity of the Henry site. We did get a great deal of input, over 500 responses from family members, teachers, students. Um, in fact, the entire Gunston Montessori completed um, some information for us to let us know their thoughts on the Montessori program um, and the different grade configuration possibilities. And then we final, we came together and the team looked at their recommendations, which I'm going to show you um, the large overarching themes tonight. So one of them was to move the entire Drew Montessori primary, which is ages three to five, all the way through grades five to the Henry building in 2019 um, to maintain the primary Montessori satellite classes. And for those who don't know, we do have seven locations, um, seven schools around the county house primary Montessori classes. Five of those sites have what we've called singleton classes, which means there's only one class um, within that school building. Um, so nobody for that teacher to collaborate with who's also teaching uh, with the Montessori pedagogy. So one of their recommendations was to not have any of those singleton classes. Um, we know capacity is an issue around the county, so we will look at next steps for that. Additionally, the group would like to grow Montessori at Henry by offering admission to those students who are in primary Montessori satellites as they finish that kindergarten year in the satellite to be able to offer um, positions to those students at the Henry Montessori program starting in first grade. Um, they also would like the ability for some students from private Montessori's who've gone through kindergarten to have the ability to enter a lottery um, for that school as well. And the final was a consideration for including sixth grade at the Henry site 
Currently, the three-year um, Montessori model has fourth, fifth, and sixth grade together in some school settings. So they wanted us to consider what this might look like. Currently, that sixth grade is, is housed at Gunston right now. And so now we look at some capacity and growth, and we really just put a few potential options out there. Um, we're, we have to take a much closer look to see how uh, we might be able to make this happen. Um, but it is dependent on how many relocatables would be used. The Henry site would, uh, has a capacity of around um, 460 some students. And so with relocatables of about 24 students in each class, with two re relocatables, the school could have approximately 511 students. Um, if there were 10 relocatables, which is what is there now, uh, they could have up to 703 students. And 12 relocatables is the maximum, according to uh, facilities um, and planning, that we could have on that site. Um, that would get you to a maximum of 751 students in that building. So the team looked at you know, who might those students potentially be um, taking those precious spaces in um, the Montessori site. So 463 kids would be coming from the Drew Montessori into the building. So it's really a decision of who those other students might be and how large the building um, would grow too. So we looked at the potential for first graders leaving those primary Montessori satellites to have lottery spots to enter first grade at the Henry Montessori site. Um, and there were also some options that would show the potential for sixth grade students to be included. And that's something we definitely need to look um, further out, at, furthermore at and, um, and look at some of the instructional pieces to that. Our next steps are really to look at the capacity of that Henry building and to continue to work on our admission process for that 2019 start. Um, determine feasibility of a sixth grade program and what that would also mean to the Gunston Montessori if sixth grade did come over. We need to plan for the grouping of those primary Montessori satellites to be able to not be on their own with one in a school here and one in a school there, um, and work with human resources to develop a plan to recruit high quality Montessori teachers um, and provide professional learning. So potentially taking some of our own APS teachers and offering opportunities for them to become Montessori trained. And of course, we the group would invite civic association participation regarding the parking and transportation, but also um, we know that that will be, the use of relocatables will definitely be something that the um, civic association will want to give input on. And I welcome any questions. Excellent, thank you. Ms. Elliott, any speakers? No speakers. Uh, board colleagues, comments or questions? Mr. Lander. Thank you, Ms. Pilch. Uh, As you look at the strategy to approach and all the things you're considering in maximizing the site, at the Henry, maximizing the Henry building for the site of the Montessori, the slide right before that mm -hmm. one, all of those factors, the one right before this one. Okay. Uh, not the recommendations, where you look at HR, the considerations that you had. When you look at uh, the recruit, right there, next steps. When you look at the recruitment strategy, when you look at the feasibility of sixth grade inclusion, all those things, how are they, weigh, what are the weight, weight factors? How are you weighing the factors so you can determine sort of how you, what is the best way forward? Because I know there's a number of different ways we can go. Mm -hmm. So how are you, how, how are we gonna make that decision? Well, we'll definitely be a team to look at the instructional impact. Um, we're going to have to take a look at the current teachers we have um, and how we can, for example, could we grow to 600 at the prime by adding all those primary students right away? We would need to look and see whether we actually have enough primary Montessori trained teachers um, 
and what the feasibility is to recruit that high quality, the number of high quality teachers we'll need. So I see a lot of planning in the Department of Teaching and Learning, um, as well as inviting additional uh, community input, um, looking at some next steps in terms of how we plan for what and for who is going to be in that building in 2019 outside of just those students. But um, we'll be working together as a team with multiple departments to. Right, and so this, in addition to being a part of the strategy for Montessori at Henry, this will also, I assume Dr. Nasters, be a part of the overall K through 12 model and all the things that we're doing at the elementary school level. So it it is, one piece that we'll focus on, but that piece will need to fit into all the other stuff we're doing. I mean, as with much of the work that we're doing, that complex and overlapping project slide that we use a lot in the superintendent's update, this falls into that as well, right? So there are um, impacts with, we wanted to bring forward, here's what the group has done in terms of recommendations and things. This will also be something that the Career Center Working Group will have to look at. The middle school boundary conversation may play into this, um, as well as I had a third bucket that also I was thinking about as we were here, but this is a piece of that. So what we did over the course of the fall was sit down with the Montessori community to say, in your ideal world, as we move to Henry, what is it that you think are the recommendations? And then we'll be able to take this information and start putting it into what's happening with the Career Center Working Group, what's happening with the middle school boundary process, what's happening with the K-12 instructional vision, and where these pieces fit. So those are the next steps now that we've gotten the input and the recommendations from the specific Montessori community. Right, and, and I appreciate that because that, mm -hmm is sort of the foundation of the question I was gonna ask because when the board looks at um, middle school boundaries, I mean middle school, elementary school boundaries and we start uh, aligning elementary schools with certain middle schools, currently the program for uh, Montessori is at Gunston at the middle school program. I don't know if it will stay there, I, I have no idea, but I think that parents who um, aren't necessarily associated with Montessori now may want to pay attention to the process and being uh, um, uh, vigilant about the changes happening in the system. So my guess is ACI will also be a part of this too. It will expand beyond just the Montessori cohort that you've been working with since this will fit into the larger scheme at the elementary school level. Sure, I mean, these are pieces that, again, the Career Center Working Group, as well as the Boundary Group, and then the Strategic Planning Group with the K-12 instructional vision work, and then all of that goes back to ACI and various other groups. So there will be multiple um, stakeholder groups that then have this information and can say, okay, here's what we heard from the Montessori community. Now, how does that fit within this particular decision? How does that fit within this particular decision? And what might the impact be? So that's where I see this moving forward, right? We've got that input and now we start figuring out where it fits within um, all of those other complex and overlapping projects. Right, and my, and my last point, I'll just, and, and, and this is not necessarily a question, but the second bullet we were talking about the feasibility of sixth grade inclusion um, at the Henry site, in addition to working with human resources, my guess is that the board and teaching and learning will work with finance also to find out what is the right model because I know that that isn't something we've done before. So the impact of, of electives and all the other things that yes. students have access to as sixth grade is mm -hmm. gonna be part of consideration. Thank you. Yes. Ms. Van Dorn. Yes, I have a question um, for Dr. Murphy. Um, I, I, I have to bring, you know I have a thing about presentations that don't have money associated with them because we are going into budget season and we're always thinking about how we're financing things and we, we know that we'll be having a tight budget and I see a lot of dollars up there and it would be helpful to me and I think to the community as we weigh where we're gonna be expending those dollars to know what the cost of some of this is. So I would just ask that we, we do that. I don't know if you have any financial information for us or when we can expect to have that, what you're, what you're looking forward to. But um, there are going to be a lot of competing interests in our budget coming, I presume. So if you can help me with the money part 
I'd appreciate it. Sure, I, I, um, I know I've shared this uh, before and we have to be mindful of it. Um, you know, we're facing a, a gap this coming year, uh, somewhere between 21 and $23 million. The governor's budget comes out tomorrow and Ms. Peterson continues to remind me of that. So we'll see things continue to ebb and flow. But coupled with that, we need to remind everyone in the fall of 2019, we will be opening uh, potentially five buildings and associated with all those decisions are a certain level of um, operational costs um, that we will see play themselves out here next year at about this time with uh, that year's budget. So uh, my comments initially when I introduced this was this is some feedback or input initially from the Montessori Working Group, but we have some other steps that we will need to take in considerations as far as how we look at the whole picture, and we'll be coming back to the board with that information. And that will have some financial ramifications. Oh, abso and, yeah, absolutely, yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay, Ms. Talento. I, um, I think I'm providing feedback. So, and then I guess if it develops into a question, we'll, we'll move to that direction. Uh, you mentioned the um, satellite pre-K programs. So early education, you know, very important. And the unique thing about Montessori is that it allows us to uh, provide pre-K to three-year-olds in our community. And so uh, while I think it's a great opportunity to move Montessori to Patrick Henry, I am very concerned about um, removing satellite Montessori programs from our community to one place um, because Montessori does serve a lot of communities, uh, communities of, um, who really value, who can't afford pre-K or child care at that age and are taking advantage of the Montessori program so that their three-year-old can start early education. And putting that in one place, you know, I would really want more dialogue or more um, depth of understanding how that would work and how we would be able to continue to service a lot of families. I was at a presentation in Knock the other evening and I, they mentioned that there are families who may not move with the Montessori program at Drew because they value walkability in, in the neighborhood. Um, but these are families that also had that we're using the Montessori pre-K program there, and they value that. I mean, that's also something I heard meeting with another community, um, very separate, they asked, are you going to have more pre-K programs that offer services to three-year-olds? Because we would really value that. So while I recognize the opportunity to bring Montessori to one place, at the pre-K level, and having satellite classes in existence, I just think we need to have a little bit more discussion and more in-depth on what what the consequences are if we bring all of those satellite classes to one location and where we might not where we may be taking services away from our some of our community members that really depend on early childhood through that program um, may i clarify one point because i agree yes. with you completely and i know the team does as well i think um we just need to maybe clarify what we were talking about with the satellite locations um, we didn't mean to um, infer that they would all be moved to Henry necessarily. Okay. What we were talking about with this third bullet, and then I think in one of the previous slides, is actually to try to ensure that every satellite Montessori program has a pair with them. Oh, okay, So great. right now, right, I they're not, individually. That is not how right. I saw so that. I think okay, I great. To clarify. So to make sure that teachers have someone to collaborate with within Perfect. the school, um, which may mean we may lose it at one to put it over here, but if they're close geographically anyway, Okay. We're still providing it to that community. Okay. Um, so just, we agree. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I was yeah. clearly, after my little speech yeah. there, I was concerned. Okay. So it was <laughs> Thank great. You. It, it moved everything, <laughs> transitioned the whole thing. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I think I had one more question, but I'm going to let Mr. Goldstein, because I don't remember it right now. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Goldstein. Thank you. Um, can you go to slide four, please? Um, yeah, four. Um, what was my question? Oh, yeah, in the third bullet. Um, uh, grow Montessori by offering admission to first grade students from the satellite locations. Can you refresh me on the progression of students? Because I would have expected that to say kindergarten. 
So mon Instead of first primary grade. Montessori is three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and five-year-olds. So that's essentially two preschool programs and a kindergarten. So they finish that primary Montessori and then they go into lower Montessori in what is first grade in our elementary schools. So that's why it's first grade instead of kindergarten. And at the uh, satellite locations, um, we have that primary yes. through kindergarten. Yes. So the students in Montessori at the satellite locations are staying through it's a it's a Montessori kindergarten. Correct. It's not a regular. Correct. And then they may go to first grade if that's their home school or their neighborhood school. So they may do three, four, and five year olds there and then go into first grade there, or they can apply to go to first grade at Henry, or they may go to first grade back at their neighborhood school if they were in a satellite location that fed from somewhere else. But it's a first grade entry point into lower Montessori. And that's true for the private uh, Montessori programs also? Yes, it is. They typically um, keep the five-year-olds there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Instead and that's of, why uh, we opened an additional classroom at Drew this year because we had such an influx of first graders coming in. So we had that same issue this past fall. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you. I just have a couple of questions. Actually, let me follow up on Mr. Goldstein's question about um, offering first grade slots to students from satellite locations and private Montessori programs. Is that your understanding of how our transfer policy is intended to work or is that a recommendation for how you think it should work? This and, was and a, we, the, the group is recommending that they're, depending on the number of slots, that we have a lottery for the first grade students entering from primary satellites or and or private. But our, our transfer policy would actually, it, we don't refer to um, current you Montessori correct. students. It really would be open to any students in first grade. With the one that was adopted in June. In our new transfer policy. Correct. Okay. You are correct. Okay. So this yes. is a recommendation. Correct. Okay. Um, and when are we going to, what, what do we do with these recommendations? What's, what are the next steps for considering them? Yep. So this is the piece around we need to take these recommendations and see how they align with and work with what we are currently doing with the Career Center Working Group um, because I think the with these different scenarios of relocatables may be a big part of that discussion as we're looking at what happens with the Career Center as well as looking at as we do the strategic plan, how does this align with that K-12 instructional vision and then as we think about middle schools, one of the things Mr. Lander said earlier was right now the program's housed at Gunston, will that remain at Gunston? It's going to depend on a lot of those other things. So what I foresee is happening is to taking these recommendations and then looking at the different options that are here and plugging them into those other um, pieces of work that are happening to then say, okay, this fits really nicely with what the Career Center Working Group is recommending. This fits really well with what we've said with middle school boundaries. It also fits really nicely with our K-12 instructional vision. So this is the option that we are going to implement for Montessori. And we'll be able to look at the budget implications that Ms. Van Doren was discussing because depending on the how many and where, that'll impact transportation as well as some other things. So we take these recommendations and we start plugging them into the various other projects and things. So when will we see how this all plays out? When does it come back to us? This, I believe, will come back in those various other elements like I'm okay. not sure that we come back with a separate gotcha. here's what okay. we're doing with Montessori but we come back with a here's what the Career Center working group has said here's where Montessori fits into that or here's what's happened with middle school boundaries here's where Montessori fits into that etc so we take this and we plug yeah. it into those okay other pieces. similar when we do budget yes exactly and through yeah same um, thing for budget it would yeah go in there. so the numbers the um, demand so you said there are 463 students right now Montessori students at Drew and that's approximately the size I think the capacity at Henry. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And do you know um, what the demand is, what the waiting lists are right now for Montessori? So I would look. Wendy says she has some numbers. I was also looking. Okay. Kathy Genovese with us. Kathy so can, can give us the current wait list for the Drew Montessori. But when I look at the primary Montessori satellite locations, we have 232 students um, that are three, four, and five year olds. So the question is whether 
those students would want to go to their um, neighborhood school or whether they would apply again to be able to attend the Montessori school. And, and no waiting list at Drew? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, it looks like um, there are additional questions. Ms. Talento, let's let me. Thank you for the presentation. This is very helpful um, in understanding how this will be threaded in through future in, or current initiatives. So I'm going to ask questions re knowing that. So the two questions I have is. If you can help me under, is, is the entry point right now for the Montessori program first grade? The, the entry point for Montessori is the primary Montessori three-year-old. Okay, so, but, so if you're at Drew and you're at their pre-K program, you're guaranteed a spot in their first, in, Correct. in the second. Correct, you get to stay through fifth okay. grade currently. But if you're f coming from a private Montessori pre-K, you have to apply to get into, currently into Drew in the first grade level. Correct, and there is um, usually there's a requirement of some Montessori experience right. um, at, at any future enrollment. levels. Correct. Right. So okay. So um, so it, when when we move it to Patrick Henry, that's where the discussion is: is do we continue the first grade level entry for all since it's now its own school? So my question would be: is if we have if we have pre, if we have the primary level at Patrick Henry? but we also have satellite classes and then we have private classes, will the ones at Patrick Henry be automatically entered into the first grade, into the regular curriculum? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know the jargon for the... Currently, the way we have it uh, established, they would. That, um, and we're, we're working on the um, applications right now for mm -hmm. primary Montessori for next year, but uh, potentially a parent could select Drew... Montessori for next right. year, and also select a neighborhood satellite Montessori, mm -hmm. and then if they were lucky enough to get into both um, through the lottery, they could, if they select the Drew Montessori one, that would be the only one currently where they would have guaranteed through okay. fifth grade. So there, so, and I'm just trying to understand where the group is coming from. If we have a primary Montessori, which is a three to five year old at Patrick Henry, the idea is is that the mon is the three to five year old site at Patrick Henry would have automatic admission into the first, second, and third grade, but satellite Montessori's and private Montessori's would have to apply through a lottery system for the first grade. That's one of okay. the recommendations. The, okay. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. That's very helpful. And then the next question is is if you if we were to move sixth grade as they're discussing, what is the vision for the seventh and eighth grade Montessori? Because now they're missing a a piece of their cohort, um, and in the middle school, it's a much more complex uh, education platform right. compared to... We, we would need to take a closer look at how that would impact 7th um, and 8th grade Montessori and, and really dig into the instructional impact of that. This is a recommendation from the group based on um, some of the research that the group um, dug into. However, we really would need to come back to you okay. um, with so, how the instructional implications would fit in. So that idea is preliminary. We haven't really looked to see what Correct. the ramifications would be to our middle school Montessori program. Correct. Okay, that's helpful. So that way, as we move forward, I have as much information as possible to thread through the um, different initiatives that you mentioned. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Goldstein. Uh, yeah, thank you. One more um, quick question. Um, you said there are 232 um, satellite Montessori students? Correct. No, no. No, in, currently enrolled in currently the enrolled primary in satellite, satellite locations. There are two. Maybe want to go to Who? first grade. What? I'm sorry, I missed that. Outside of the Drew Montessori students, there are currently 232 attending primary Montessori satellites within right. APS. Right. Right. And do we have an understanding of how many of them would like to move to lower so after their um, primary Montessori uh, years? From the input we got from over, we had approximately 500 
um, responses to input and we were able to really drill down to look at who currently had a student enrolled in a primary satellite and over 80% of those families said that they would be interested in continuing through at least fifth grade if they were given access to that. Those are the satellite Correct. families, not the private Montessori, because everybody needs Montessori experience, right, to be considered for first grade? Typically. Yeah. Okay, but so you're talking about 80% of the 232 indicate that they would like to move to the, um, the lower Montessori program. Correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I think I didn't get an answer to the question I asked. I was asking about the waiting list, not the students that are in the satellite program. We have several hundred students on waiting lists in the primary satellites for entry as three and four year olds. Um, I would, oh. yeah, so, but at okay. Drew Montessori, we're not sure of the exact number, but. Um, you don't have to have Montessori experience. They can all apply. Anybody can apply. It's just the order of the students that we accept at first grade. We give priority to students that are coming from the primary satellites that want to continue their Montessori education. So when we do the lottery, those are the first students that are admitted. And then we look at students, um, Arlington students that might have done a private primary program and want to come in as first graders and then we also have lottery for students that just want to come in um, to the program that didn't have Montessori experience. Mr. Novi, just for clarity purposes, so I guess that wouldn't be for you, I, I'm sorry, that would be for Dr. Natchez. Would there be a policy recommendation made to the board after the strategic plan because the process that you're going to utilize will sort of go through different vetting <coughs> stages. You've been through the part with the Montessori um, uh, AMAC, I guess is the group, mm -hmm. and then there has to be the boundary portion, there'll be a budget portion, there'll be a strategic plan portion, and then after those processes, there'll be a recommendation that are, I guess will be shared with the board as it gets developed. And so at that time, will you consider policy changes if needed if after the strategic plan? Yes, so if after all of those pieces are in place and there's something like we were just discussing with the application process that would be um, different from what's in the transfers and options piece, then we would have to come back to the board if there was a policy tweak for that. Um, so what we're currently trying to do is look at what's here, look at that transfer and options, and make sure that they're married as we go through and look at some of these pieces. Um, and if for some reason we found that they aren't, we would come back to the board with a, here's a policy piece that we think we need to address. Excellent. I think we'll continue this conversation I think yes. going yep. forward. So yes, yes. Ms. Talento. I'm sorry, I just have one quick one question. One last question. Totally Are you continuing to meet as a Montessori, Montessori um, committee is will they will the the working group that has gotten us to this point will they continue to meet so or are we done with this part of the process this particular piece of the process is complete as we've worked with that group there are also um, some next steps that the group has come up with that they want to be thinking about and considering as we're moving forward some of it is the instruction in sixth grade piece some of it is just the logistics of the transition to a new building so we anticipate continued engagement it may be a little bit different than this group who was put together specifically to make these recommendations okay thank you Great, thank you very thank much. You. We have one final monitoring item this evening and it is on our sustainability efforts. Dr. Murphy. Yes, I'm gonna turn to uh, Dr. Datley and uh, Ms. Kathy Lind who are gonna uh, both present this evening some of uh, APS's sustainability efforts, both from f uh, facility and operation as well as a curriculum standpoint. I also know we have members of the group here that are, um, part of the superintendent's sustainability uh, group, and they may have some information to share as well. So I'll, I'll turn to you folks. 
Thank you, Dr. Murphy, Dr. Cannon, and members of the school board. Dot and I are pleased to present to you tonight the sustainability update. So what we'd like to cover is how sustainability really touches everything we do here in the school district, from building new schools in our capital projects to our daily operations. We'd like to give you an update on the Solar Power Purchase Agreement, RFP. Acknowledge our sustainability committee. They've been a great support for us. And then DOT really will like to make that connection of sustainability to teaching and learning and how it really empowers our students. And then we'd like to close with some key takeaways and next steps. So as we continue to grow, as we're learning, we're continuing to grow all the time, we are building more schools. And it's really important to make considerations when we design buildings. Uh, according to the EPA, Americans spend about 90% of our time indoors. So we want to ensure that our indoor air quality, that the space indoor is optimal for our students and for our staff. So we really have certain sustainability criteria that are very important, like indoor air quality, bringing natural daylight, making that connection to nature for our students, looking at renewable technologies when they're feasible and cost effective, looking at how we site schools so that we site them well in our communities so that people can walk and bike to school. Stormwater is very important in our community as well as nationally as we've seen with the major hurricanes when we have more impervious space as we continue to grow. Looking at our transportation opp opportunities and then always considering budget. Really looking at first cost versus life cycle cost and do we understand what we pay to build the school and how much it costs to operate that school because we really want to design cost-effective high-performance buildings. There has to be an integrated approach. So everything we do here in APS really supports teaching and learning. We're really supporting our students and we really want to give them the, the most optimal environments possible. Our services that we provide from you know, feeding them in the morning and at lunchtime, the technology that we provide, the, how we take care of our schools, our custodians who are really the eyes and ears of our building, how we purchase items, you know, how we communicate with our parents, with our staff, with our community, and then how we get our students to and from school and staff. So some of the sustainability highlights that we have and that was recognized a few weeks ago at VSBA were really kind of the efforts of all our staff here. You know, how we recycle, when we have technology. You know, we try to reuse it as much as possible. We also try to look for opportunities to sell the technology, and then we recycle them. You know, really reducing our waste. Looking at green cleaning opportunities because we're indoors a lot, reducing kind of the chemicals, and really looking at opportunities to work with vendors to have green cleaning products. I know that our plant operations team is continuing to roll out a microfiber program. So we're not just using items and then just throwing them away, but really reusing them and reducing the toxins inside the school. I know our food and nutrition services program really promote healthy eating. That's really key to our students. Greeting them in the morning when they have a healthy breakfast so they can stay engaged and active throughout the day and giving them healthy opportunities and showing them good choices to make as they're in the cafeteria. Preventive maintenance is key for all our buildings, just like preventive health is important. If we take care of our buildings, we have less um, room to have emergencies. We don't, we don't lose instructional time when we have to close schools. We really need to think about taking care of our buildings well. Again, with recycling, it's important. We really need to stress recycling. We need to improve upon it. And we have to look at how we do trash as well. Reduce our trash because that's important. And finally, transportation. How do we get our students and staff to school? How do we route the buses in the most effective ways so that we're using our transportation resources well? Sustainability does have measurable impacts. Some are qualitative and others are quantitative. When we do farm to school, when we encourage healthy eating, that's really bringing a quality of life to our students, especially those that may not have an opportunity to have that at their, in their homes. Um, school and Community Relations has done a fantastic job with rolling out Peach Jar. I know that as a parent of a, for more than one child, when we had backpack meal in elementary school, receiving three copies of the same item seemed a little much. 
So with PHDAR being an online resource that's available, you really are reducing your paper cost and your staff cost in that regards. We've done some lighting upgrades and we continue to do them in our facilities as the lighting products get old, the fixtures get older, and we're really seeing savings in energy on an annual basis. We're also providing water bottle filling stations for our students and for our staff, especially our students who stay after school and play sports, giving them the opportunity to bring their own water bottle to school and not using single-use plastic bottles. And then finally, really working with transportation finding good ways to get our students and staff to school. As we grow, it is more congested, and it's a safety issue, too, to reduce the single occupancy use vehicles. I'm actually very encouraged, because when I go to work, I see students, middle school, middle school students especially, because it's so early, riding their bike, even in weather like this, and we want to encourage that kind of behavior. An update on the solar power purchase agreement with really, we've worked really hard with our purchasing department to issue the RFP to look at possibly putting more solar um, photovoltaic arrays on our school, on our existing schools. We feel like this is a great opportunity. The solar PVs have come down greatly in price. We know that it, it can possibly very, be very competitive to what we're paying in our electricity cost. And what it allows us to do is to hedge our bets. Electricity rates are going to continue to rise. This gives us an opportunity to explore another way to get power to our schools. And it also reduces emissions, really makes us support the county's community en energy plan, and provides learning opportunities for our students. In 2016, the, one of the greatest growing job areas was renewable technology. Solar installers, wind turbine technicians nationally. So this gives us an opportunity to bring this on board for our students. And I'd like to acknowledge our sustainability committee. We have one member here tonight, Greg Lloyd, who's been with us, I think, from the very beginning. But the committee has been around for six years. They, are a wealth of, um, they have a wealth of knowledge and expertise, and they really support us in our sustainability efforts. They're very excited to have started the pilot program last year for sustainability liaisons. And these are staff in the school that are really promoting sustainability in their school. This year, it's grown to 15 liaisons, and we actually have a buddy program. So someone from the committee really acts as a resource and kind of a sounding board for the liaisons, and I think they're really excited about it. The committee also really wants to focus on how we purchase things. You know, do we purchase it well? You know, we buy a lot of stuff. Is there a way to minimize this stuff? Really focusing on recycling, improving it, and you know, looking at how we manage waste. They have a Green Action Awards to really acknowledge the good work that our staff and students are doing. And we want to continue that because there is a lot of good work in our schools, and even though we may not be as large as Fairfax, it's hard to kind of collaborate and get the word out because everyone's so busy. So we really want to recognize the good work that everyone's been doing. And then continued communications and outreach. I'm very fortunate to serve as the co-liaison with Kathy Lynn on the Superintendent's Sustainability Advisory Committee. Sustainability continues to be a collaborative effort in our school division. We have been focusing on educating and engaging our students in the areas of sustainability and environmental education, as well as civic responsibility. Currently, the state of Virginia requires all school divisions to provide environmental education and meaningful watershed educational experiences to all students at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. In our school division, we provide many different opportunities to support environmental literacy. The science curriculum and programs that we have in place, including the outdoor lab, provides our students with many wonderful opportunities to learn about the watershed and the ecosystem. It provides our students opportunities to learn science, outdoor skills, and environmental stewardship in a natural setting. Last year, over 6,000 APS students participated in the outdoor lab program. This also includes about 2,000 students participating in the fifth grade overnight program. The Outdoor Lab has been an incredible resource for our school division. Our students, parents, and teachers tell us that the Outdoor Lab is one of their favorite activities during the school year. 
Last year, the Science Office received a three-year federal grant to support environmental literacy with a focus on stormwater management and problem-based learning. The NOAA Be Wet grant provides our teachers with training and valuable resources and equipment to conduct scientific investigations. The project is a collaboration between our county government in Arlington, Arlingtonians for a Clean Environment, and the National Wildlife Federation, and we're very fortunate to leverage their expertise to support our teachers. The Outdoor Lab and the NOAA Be Wet program are just two great examples of how we support sustainability education in Arlington. We hope to provide these types of learning experiences across our school division. The Sustainability Liaison, Liaison Program, which we piloted just last year, will help expand opportunities for sustainability education and engagement across all of APS. The program has three main goals. One of it is for outreach and engagement. The second one is for both teachers and students to identify and implement projects that they find that are valuable to support sustainability in Arlington. And then finally, sharing and communicating the outcomes from these projects. We have, as Kathy mentioned, a pilot program last year that started with 10 programs. And this year, we're very excited because there are 15 programs that are in place. Our sustainability liaisons have led projects in the areas of recycling, transportation, schoolyard habitat restoration, and waste management. Our schools and community members are extremely excited about the impacts that our sustainability liaisons have done so far and have made tremendous, tremendous efforts in our schools and communities. We're very proud of them and we look forward to the continual work of our sustainability liaisons. Um, I'm gonna pass this back to Kathy. Thanks. So what are the key takeaways? Sustainability really encourages our students to be active. It makes the connections to learning, they're engaged, they're outdoors. We're really trying to connect it to the whole child because that's what sustainability is. Really connecting to your community, to your um, nature, and to outside. Sustainability also has budget impacts. And for this, I'm really sharing you our utility costs. Budget impacts is everything. So life cycle cost is more than just utility, it's really how much we spend on maintaining our buildings. So if we know that we spend 30 million on building the school, how much do we actually spend taking care of that school for 20 years? Those are important numbers to really have and understand, because then you can make a good comparison about life cycle costs versus first costs. What I can share with you is utility costs. So as we've grown as a school district, we've grown in square footage. Um, our energy cost, as you can see, per square foot in 2012 compared to what it is in 2017. So as we've grown, our energy cost per square foot has gone down, as well as our utility cost per square foot, so that our budget has remained fairly stable for utilities. However, if our energy costs continue to increase like they were in 2012, and we use 2012's energy cost per square foot, on how much square footage we have now, you could see that the, the budget impact would be $500,000 more to go to utilities. So energy has an impact on budget, utility does, but as, well as so, so does life cycle costs. And those are the things we really need to capture to be sustainable, to provide a sustainable infrastructure for our school district. So what are our next steps? Continued engagement and outreach with our groups, with our sustainability liaisons, working with the outdoor lab, really looking at our existing facilities, seeing how we can improve on them in energy efficiency and maintenance and operations, and then really kind of trying to get a handle on our life cycle costs. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. Ms. Elliott, do we have speakers? Okay, board colleagues, questions, comments? Ms. Talento. Do we have um, a composting program in, in APS? I know that the Career Center has a composting station, but I didn't know with a lot of the work you're doing and some of the efforts that you men mentioned for waste management and healthy living, I was just curious um, if we have something. We do program. not have a composting program district-wide. 
what we have is I know several schools have their um, outdoor learning environments and they do um, compost their outdoor, their leaves and their grass okay. and their clippings. There is an opportunity on our new waste and recycling contract to compost. And that is, um, I know our staff is looking at it because it's a cost issue, so we right. need to balance cost versus the opportunity to compost. Okay. Um, and then the next question I have is, when we're looking at so the RFPs and solar energy, are we, are we dealing with any challenges as far as where a building is lo located to capture that sun? Um, and I'm not, it's not my, I'm not an expert in this at all, but I know that there are homes that solar energy doesn't work for because of way th where they are situated. Right. And as we're looking to, at our capital projects, you know, what does that mean? And we're gonna have to compromise um, sustainability versus, um, you know, location for the school as we're building or, you know, how it's facing or what, what is the cost value. So I'm trying to understand a little better, are those real challenges for us in APS as well? Are some of our buildings not amenable to solar panels to capture that, that, that um, to work with that project? Right, so some buildings may not be. What we did in the first RFP when we issued it was we selected five sites. And the five sites, we actually um, did a survey of all five sites to look at the solar opportunity. And they, have, they give us a great deal of solar opportunity because there's no shading, there's not a lot of equipment on the roof. So we did make, take those into consideration when we did this RFP. So we're hopeful that we'll, we'll get some good um, bidders on this. Thank you very much. I have a couple of, of questions. Um, on the recycling you mentioned, are you guys connected to the student advisory board on this on this topic? They have that that's one of their interests this year that they really want to work on recycling. I don't know if you know some scouts have done some work and found that um, recycling has kind of fallen off. It's it used to be a big thing and you know it kind of isn't a focus anymore in some of our schools and the student advisory board has identified it as something they want to do. So maybe that's something, uh, a connection you guys. That is actually a very good connection and we'd love to reach out to them and I know that the sustainability committee would like to do that too because it's something that the sustainability committee would like to do. So I will definitely make that connection and you know, try to We have the them. people in the room to do it. Ms. Johnson's here, the liaison, Ms. Talento, yeah. Ms. Johnson. And I would like to follow up because it just so happened that that is a topic of interest and tonight was the meeting with principals. It was a point of discussion. We have followed up with Kerm Taller on the information that is available on our website that is guiding the recycling initiative in the county, so we'll follow up. Okay, that's great, thank you. Make that connection, yeah. Um, I also want to ask, you mentioned the outdoor lab, and many of us are big fans. Um, I got a letter this week from a, a high school student who is in environmental science, and um, she mentioned that environmental science used to go to the outdoor lab for something. I'm not quite, I, I don't know what they do out there, but um, she said they do not have that opportunity this year. And again, that's, as our student population is growing, it's harder to get all the students out there, but it, is that the case then that are there, are, who's getting to go and who's not at this point or how, how has that changed in the last year or so? As we deal with capacity issues in our buildings, we also need to remember that there are capacity issues with our programs. So we used to have the opportunity to send our elementary, middle and high school students to the outdoor lab. But as our elementary student population grows, now instead of having two classes, let's say at Drew, we may have more than two, or Tuckahoe from two to three. So in order to accommodate all of those schools, we have to reallocate the slots from the high school to the elementary school to make them whole. And unfortunately, our out, we only have 200 days or approximately 200 days of schools, so we can't really expand that beyond the 200 days. So we're looking at creative options to support environmental education for the higher, um, the upper grade levels. Uh, currently, we have uh, programs in place for elementary and middle, and at the high school level, we're looking at leveraging um, opportunities with our local regional parks at um, perhaps uh, uh, Lubber Run and also at Long Branch and Gulf Branch where we had um, representatives from those uh, uh, 
organizations to come and meet with us. Um, they had mentioned that those areas have been underutilized and we're looking to create partnerships where we can uh, have our high school students use those areas for a lot of the programs that are related to environmental and sustainability education. So there might be a bit of a gap though, like it's not gonna happen this year, I think. It's not gonna it happen like you're, this you're year. Talking, and, so. and it's an issue that we're, it's a situation that we're looking at and finding creative ways, given the budget constraints at the same time as well. And the option of looking at um, utilizing the uh, regional parks, um, Potomac Overlook and, and those areas. We're also looking at savings in terms of transportation because rather than having uh, the buses going down to the outdoor lab, the, the distance is a lot closer. So we're looking at ways to uh, look at cost savings, but as the same, at the same time, provide our students with those opportunities for outdoor learning. That's great, I hope we can get it done so these students can take advantage of it. I mean, it does sound like then this year the environmental science classes are not going to get these opportunities, but hopefully we'll, we'll pull it together. And I like your, you know, I think we all appreciate your focus on cost savings. It's on our minds right now. So um, in, investing in sustainable budget is, is helpful in addition to sustainability in <laughs> the environmental sense. Thank you. All set? Okay. Could I have two seconds to do a quick shout out to Mr. Landers to of thank course. him also for his support for STEM education and for science education. Um, over the last seven years, he had attended our regional science fair and has been a great supporter of the science fair, science program and our science students at the regional science fair. So thank you. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, we are going on now to our action items, and the first action item is middle school boundaries. Dr. Murphy, do you have any additional information for us? Yes, I'd uh, like to turn to uh, Dr. Sarah Johnson. Uh, Dr. Johnson is just going to provide us with a brief update as far as uh, where we are with uh, the middle school boundary recommendation. I also want to recognize uh, Ms. Lisa Stingel and the entire team from our planning office and thank them for all the work that they have done in leading this middle school boundary process. Uh, it has been a tremendous. I also think it's been very successful. Uh, and we definitely have engaged the community and received uh, quite a bit of input uh, as far as how we have shaped the recommendations and gotten to this point. So again, to, to Ms. Stingle and the entire team uh, I see here this evening, thank you. Uh, and Dr. Johnson, I will turn to you. Sure, good evening. So on November 30th, we came to the, I will flip the slide first. On November 30th, we came to the school board with the recommendation we called updated option A, V2. And we're making that same recommendation this evening. With this boundary change, over, over just over 1,500 students would be reassigned to a new middle school. 84 planning units would be moved, 61 of which would actually go to the new middle school at the Stratford site. More than 50% of students are in the potential walk zone in four of those schools. We have a capacity range um, from 89% at Williamsburg to 111% at Swanson. And we have a range of students who are ec economically disadvantaged from 1% at Williamsburg to 54% at Kenmore. If this recommendation is accepted, the following will, the following will happen. In February 2018, families impacted by the boundary change will receive notification by mail. In 2019, the new middle school will open, and all 6th, 7th, and 8th graders will attend their newly assigned middle school. Is that it? Okay. Thank you. Um, let me just uh, let you all know what the, what the plan is from here. We're going to first see if the board, board members have clarifying questions. Then we'll take a motion. After the motion and in a second, we will go to speakers. Then any other board comment, and then we'll vote. Okay? So um, first, can I ask if board colleagues, do you have clarifying questions? Not commentary, clarifying questions. Any? Ms. Talento. Um, on page two of the PowerPoint, it says 52%. I know that other numbers are shown 54%. Could you, on the percent of economically disadvantaged, could you uh, clarify? 
If I'm sorry, did it, did I say 52? It should say 54. It says 52 on the PowerPoint, so I just wanted to, and I know that we had seen other data points at 54, but there were, I didn't know if it was affected by the updated option A too. It's not, I just think it might be a mistake on the slide. That okay, that's slide fine, did. I just, thank you for the clarification. Anything else? Okay, may I have a motion? Uh, I have a motion, Madam Chair. Uh, I move the school board accept the superintendent's middle school boundary change, updated option A, version two, to take effect for the short start of the school year 2019-20. Per the school board policy 25-2.2, dated 6-1-2017, the superintendent will provide an annual update to the school board on enrollment levels in transportation and will make recommendations to achieve the goals of that policy. As part of the forthcoming annual updates, the school board directs the superintendent to propose possible program moves and or new programs and or boundary refinements at the middle and or high school level as necessary to fully utilize all middle school facilities for action by the school board no later than March 2019. The school board further directs the superintendent to develop a plan to enable transfers among all middle schools no later than November 2018. This may include utilizing, if necessary, uh, relocatable classrooms. Thank you, Mr. Lander. Is there a second? I second. Okay, thank you. Um, and we will now call for speakers. Ms. Elliott, would you like to call the speakers, please? Yes, ma'am. We have nine speakers on this topic tonight. The first, I will call you up in groups of three and ask you to line up by Jennifer, who's standing next to the post, so we can move through quickly. The first three are Hans Bauman, Anthony Panza, and Carrie Baudray. Hi, good evening. My name is Hans Bauman. I've got uh, two boys in high school and a middle schooler at Swanson Middle School in sixth grade right now. Uh, James, I'd like to thank, Mr. Land, I'd like to thank you for your hard work for eight years and sitting on the dais there. You're part of a special club that survived. Congratulations. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Murphy and senior staff and Ms. Stengel for their hard, thoughtful work and all of senior staff on open processes. I feel like we've made a lot of progress over Dr. Murphy's tenure having open processes, and I think it's really great work that's been done. I actually support the boundary changes as proposed. Um, I don't think they're perfect. I think there's all kinds of problems, but I support them in, pr in principle. Um, and yet, middle school is really hard. Um, I've, I'm my third right now. It's the shortest, but for many, it's the most difficult years um, at a particular school. Kids are spending three years going through puberty at middle school. That's what middle school is. <laughs> um, and so I'd like to ask you to consider delaying the proposed move of all eighth graders. Um, as part of this change, or at least have some sort of grandfathering provision. Uh, this would both keep fragile adolescent friendship circles together, um, but it also would allow the new middle school at Stratford to have a slightly slower ramp up in terms of its uh, establishment as a new school in our county. There's lots of precedent for grandfathering um, on board decisions, and I'd urge the board to delay the move of the eighth graders, um, even if it requires perhaps providing your own transportation on the part of parents. I understand fully that it delays the full relief of the boundary changes in terms of capacity issues, but I think it's just common sense to allow eighth graders to stay at their current middle schools for that final year. Thanks for your consideration. Good evening, everyone. My name's Anthony Panza, and I'm a parent in the Boulevard Manor neighborhood. Um, I've previously spoken on the Boulevard Manor alignment issue, but today I want to work on a slightly bigger picture. Um, first of all, I believe the additional language in the proposed motion is a very strong move by the board because it uh, recognizes the need for flexibility and humility. We might not get this exactly right on the first time, and I think it's important to set milestones in which we will reevaluate the boundaries. With that being said, what has been frustrating as a parent and a first-time Arlington school advocate um, has been that there's no clear connection between what's being proposed and the considerations that were put forward in the September and October time frame. We talk about capacity, but we see one school at 89% when the whole system's at 104%. Uh, unused space simply doesn't seem like a, a smart decision at this point. 
Uh, in terms of proximity, we have it in some areas, but there are neighborhoods that can walk to Jefferson and get bust past Kenmore to go to Swanson. I, I don't understand how that was, it makes sense from an efficiency or a proximity standpoint. Um, in terms of demographics, the, the range in Arlington is truly huge, but if you look at the trend of all of the effects here, we see that the schools that have less diversity get even less diversity, and the schools that have more continue to, to ramp. That doesn't seem like favoring diversity in demographics. It seems like it's going in the opposite direction. Uh, and finally, in terms of stability and alignment, um, Williamsburg is shedding students to, to Swanson, and Swanson is putting students back in Williamsburg. We're literally just shifting planning blocks back and forth with no clear net result to impact seventh and eighth graders who, who are coming up. I, I recognize that this plan has had a lot of good work put into it, and there's a certain amount of, of consensus behind it at this point. But I just want to take a second, take a breath, make sure, is this really in line with the goals that this board set when they started looking at this in September and October, because certainly along the edges, it, it seems like there are some, some visible flaws with it. With that being said, I thank everybody for their hard work, and I appreciate everything that you do, including you, Mr. Landers. Thank you for your service. Before Ms. Boudre speaks, the next three speakers will be Terry Randall, Hemant Sharma, and Kevin Hall. Oh, good evening. On behalf of Clarendon Courthouse Planning Units 24100 and 2411, we wish to thank the board for engaging us and hearing our concerns. We appreciate the challenges redrawing boundaries must present and are thankful to have had a voice in the process. We ask that you endorse option A version two as it pertains to our planning units. Thank you. I'm Hemant Sharma. Uh, thank you all um, for uh, listening to the concerns of Planet Unit 16110. Appreciate uh, all you guys taking the time to meet with us, several of us. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Lander, for your eight years of service. Uh, many years ago, I saw you at a, a kindergarten open night, and I was very impressed. Thank you for your service. Um, we request, uh, as we've requested before, that we stay in Swanson as opposed to being moved to uh, Williamsburg, Swanson is our walkable local school. It's about a mile away on the W and OD trail. Uh, Kathy Lynn talked a lot about sustainability. Many of our students walk or bike uh, to our local school, which is a mile away, as opposed to what they could do at Williamsburg, which is about three miles away. Um, last Thursday, one of my neighbors mentioned that 17 neighborhood middle schoolers walked home from Swanson. Uh, they were devastated to learn that some of them would have to move their eighth grade year. It was a mixed group of sixth and eighth graders, and they were bummed to hear that Williamsburg would be their new sc middle school and that they wouldn't be able to hang out with their friends after school. Um, this would be because our planning unit would be plucked from our community uh, and our only adjacent planning unit. Um, we're a very small planning unit. This won't affect too many numbers. There's less than 10 per class. We ask you to please think of what's best for our children. Thank you so much. Good evening, thank you for your time. My name is Kevin Hall, I'm a resident of Dominion Hills and a father of a, a, someone who will be a kindergartner next year. Uh, I just wanna thank you for ensuring that no vote will be taken um, on a boundary map without adequate time for communities to review the map. I was concerned that there might be a, a new map presented and a vote taken very quickly thereafter. So thank you for giving communities time to review the maps. Okay, our final three speakers are Christine Burka, Eamon Tarabishi, and Megan Keller. Hello, thank you very much, Christine Perka. Um, I'm fairly new to Arlington, moved here last year from 15 years in Asia. Um, I have two kids um, in the Arlington school system. I'm in Yorktown, uh, one in grade eight at Williamsburg and one in grade four in Discovery. Um, I've benefited firsthand seeing my children in, uh, enriched by cultural diversity and social economic diversity, living overseas for such time. Um, and I'm also currently participating in an Arlington Public Schools sponsored program for challenging racism uh, workshop and it's been incredibly eye-opening and I appreciate that opportunity. 
Um, I realize the complexity and pressures of this challenge, and I recognize the huge pressure to preserve neighborhood schools. But as a parent, I'm disappointed to see the decision push through, I feel, rather quickly, and a lack of diversity um, in the current recommendation. So my ask is a delay to pause the vote for further consideration. Um, it feels that three to four months may not be sufficient for such an important decision that has long-term implications. And <clears throat> you have new council members joining, and it doesn't, um, you have a number of new uh, boundary changes coming up and diversity really needs to be considered more greatly. More importantly, I wanna share, there's a Washington Post article that came out in 1993, to almost to the day, um, Arlington schools face pressures to improve diversity. So that's 24 years ago, December 16th, that this article came out. And they say so much of what's in this article from 24 years ago still exists today, hasn't been addressed. Um, there's also a statement that says this is a historic opportunity to improve diversity and we need to do more. Um, the Williamsburg from 24 years ago said it was going to go from 62 to 70 percent white. And now we're looking at a program for the current um, proposal up to um, 76 percent with only 1 percent economic diversity. So I fear that there would really be missing quite a bit of um, the educational disparities will continue. Sorry, thank you. Good evening, my name is Ayman Tarabishi. I am the father of two rambunctious twins, seven-year-old boys, and uh, this is what I'd like to say. Thank you, Superintendent and the Board for listening to us and responding with our revised Superintendent's proposal and for the board and to represent, uh, to accept option A, version two, particularly as it pertains to the planning units of 24100 and 24111. This falls under three key themes for us in these two particular units. One is cohesion of the unit itself, which is particularly important to us and the family members that are here. Two is the safety of our young kids in those two areas that we feel is necessary for them to have that safety net there. And three, and more importantly, is continuity. With this plan, there is a continuity plan for us to move forward with. With those three things, we feel very supportive of this, and we want to thank you all. Mr. Lander, I have never met you before, but I like you because everybody likes you here. So congratulations, <laughs> and well done. Thank you very much. Hi, good evening, and thank you also, Mr. Lander, we'll miss you. Uh, I'm here to speak about middle school boundaries, um, and I also share the compliments of many of, of um, my peers who've spoken tonight. I think this has been a really well-run process. I've been involved in other boundary processes, and I can tell that there were a lot of changes employed this time around, lessons learned, what have you, um, and the lack of a surprise map at the end was really great, so thanks. Um, with that said, I respectfully request that you defer a final decision until we can more fully explore options that would allow for more balance with respect to diversity. Um, I think the 1% diversity at Williamsburg is a travesty. Um, I know the loudest voices in our community far and away prioritized proximity, and that became the overriding guiding factor um, applied as evenly as possible to the decisions. But I don't, th and while I get it, I, I, I get it to an extent. Um, I'm not convinced that that should be at the exclusion of all other factors, like a demographic balance. I know there's no civil bullet. I know there's no easy answer. These conversations are fraught with the potential to offend. But for as long as we have the current housing pattern in Arlington, as long as we continue to prioritize proximity, Above everything else, um, we're going to continue this pattern of segregated schools, and 25 years from now, we're still going to be reading about it in the Washington Post. Um, and it's to the detriment of all of our kids, all of them, um, countywide. Uh, I spoke at the last board meeting in the spring and, and really requested, uh, I hope respectfully, uh, for the school board to show leadership in this area. I think until and unless the school board places a priority on demographic balance, we can't expect anything to change. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy, and we can't expect it to be. That's all. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming out and sharing your comments. Um, at this point, I'd like to ask my board colleagues if they would like to make comments before we turn to the vote. Mr. 
comment, Mr. Landry? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I don't, I was just checking to see if there were any questions from Ms. Johnson. We don't have any questions, right? Right. Right, we're good. Oh, so let me uh, thank everyone uh, for, who, who came out to speak tonight and thank the folks at home who have written to us and, and made their thoughts and comments known. Uh, we appreciate the feedback. There's been a lot of discussion. And one of the things that I've worked with my um, colleagues on drafting this motion is to find a balance of direction and flexibility. That was, that was the goal. And so um, we do not have the uh, luxury of delaying or waiting, in my opinion, because of some of the updates and reports you heard earlier this, early this evening with all the other changes going on in the school system. And um, I'm still trying to get my mind around the hundreds of children on the waiting list, potentially for Montessori, which is going to increase our population potentially as we grow our option school populations uh, uh, at each of the different option schools that we have. And I bring that up because um, uh, as we, all of us, have, have listened to your comments, uh, met with you during open office hours, uh, read your emails, and spoke to you sometimes by text, um, my phone is still buzzing, um, we aren't interested, not, I shouldn't say we aren't interested, we, we are not pursuing exactness. Uh, we're pursuing the best decision that makes sense now and allowing ourselves flexibility or a future board to allow self flexibility to make additional adjustments and refinements moving forward because every year the school system changes drastically. And as the young lady spoke about moving here recently from a foreign country, we welcome her family and everybody else who moves into Arlington. As you heard recently, um, if you want to drive on 66 and you don't want any company, it's going to cost you 40 bucks. That density of this Northern Virginia area has made the boundary process uh, complicated because moving children around isn't really simple as quickly as we're growing. And I remind uh, community members and parents of that because when I sit and look at different revisions of different options and, and subsets of how we move planning units around, there isn't an option set that I have been able to come up with working with staff that solves everybody's issue. It doesn't exist. So as we take those things into consideration, we take the uh, priorities that are on the wall into consideration, uh, I welcome uh, I'm thankful that this community is open to an ongoing conversation about inclusion and equity and what diversity means to different families, different folks, different communities. One of the things, and I'll reiterate this because it's important when you interact with folks who are different than yourself to understand what diversity means to them. And having had the pleasure and, and, and humbled opportunity to serve on this board, I speak to communities all across this county in every community, no matter how much money they make, no matter what language they speak at home, desire a community school which they can participate and be a part of, whether it be PTA meetings, book sales, uh, or whatever. And it is difficult, as some of you experienced this evening, getting around the county uh, because of the density. And so that has made recently uh, an overwhelming majority feedback that I have been able to read and listen to and hear here at, even at the board table, folks talking about the ability to get to their school, pick their children up, spend time with them if they're working families, walking back and forth, that quality time that they may not have if their student is bust out of their communities. And so I remind everyone about that because when we talk about uh, the priorities that family pl families place on where they choose to educate their children or how they choose to educate their children. They're making choices usually based on what's best for them. And, and, and those other things are important to them, but transportation, uh, convenience, 
usually safety are usually the things that we hear about. And, and I bring that up because we do have option programs. And I want you to take advantage of those option programs, whether it be immersion, Montessori, ATS, um, HB Woodlawn. We're going to grow Arlington Tech. We're going to grow the enrollment of these programs. Those are diverse. Those are uh, in learning styles, in, in population, in, in, in configuration. They're located in different parts of the county. Take advantage of them. We welcome you to push those uh, population uh, 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 limits as far as they can go. We want your children to take advantage of those programs so we continue to offer them. And so that is an opportunity for you to get your family, your student, into another community in a part of Arlington different than where you live and experience that type of educational opportunity you seek. Um, I still firmly believe that busing children out of their community isn't advantageous to academic excellence. Students tend statistically to do better in environments where they feel safe and supported. And we want that for all our schools, but that isn't always on the other side of town. So I want to remind us that because we uh, collectively have worked on this motion, and uh, as you can probably guess, uh, the five of us is like herding cats sometimes. But we found something that we think offers directness and flexibility and direction. And so we're going to do that. I hope to get the support for it this evening from my colleagues, but I wanted to make that comment because I'm sure um, all of us will have some version of all of the hard work that was put in to get to this point. Your comments haven't been lost on us. It's just that I don't know if we can come up with exactness. So we're seeking flexibility as we move forward, and this will give direction as we move forward. And hopefully, as we continue to grow, you know, moving children around won't be the only thing that we think about but we'll continue to offer options so that families have a choice. And that's what we want you to be able to consider. And we hope, again, you take advantage. Arlington Tech is great. Immersion is great. ATS is great. Montessori is great. Uh, HB Woodlawn, they're all great, great. As I said during kindergarten night, take advantage of those programs. Go out and meet those principals. They want you and your families at their schools, and they want you to participate. So, so that's my comment, uh, awesome. uh, Dr. Thank Cameron. you, Mr. Lander. Um, Mr. Goldstein. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a long, complicated process, and I have some uh, hopefully not too long, but complicated thoughts about it. So I hope you'll indulge me. First, I want to praise the staff for their consistent hard work developing the boundary proposal. Uh, the framework they developed and how they conducted community engagement has raised the bar in all aspects. I, I was, and I think we all were, determined not to pit, <clears throat> excuse me, not to pit neighborhood against neighborhood in a boundary process that easily <clears throat> could have done that <clears throat> if that process weren't carefully constructed and faithfully pursued. We all receive many compliments on staff's access, outreach, rapid responsiveness, flexibility, and transparency. So I want to take time to be sure they and, and everyone know that. <clears throat> that said, there are a few things in the superintendent's proposal I would like to change. This isn't a criticism of staff's work. Their job is to give us their best professional advice, not to read the tea leaves and then scramble to kowtow to board members' preferences. The, the creative process is born of competing vision, debate, and synthesis. However, the first order of business, the initiating event for a boundary change is the need to level enrollment. While doing that, we consider the six considerations to the extent possible. The superintendent's proposal leaves Williamsburg with more than 100 seats under capacity. Next door is Swanson with more than 100 seats over capacity. For many years, even before planning for discovery started, APS, the school board, the community have been consumed with angst over rising enrollments and seat deficits. 
There have been untold thousands of meeting hours, a volume of letters like they see at the North Pole, countless discussions in PTAs, at kitchen tables, on sports sidelines, hundreds of millions of dollars spent, bitter wrangling over projections, significant brain power of community members, staff, and board members, all devoted to trying to predict enrollment growth and then plan and build new seats to catch up to that growth. We've asked community members to become involved, to sacrifice family time, to give suggestions and feedback, to attend innumerable meetings, all for the purpose of expanding capacity and eliminating crowding so that their children can go to school in permanent spaces. All of that years-long juggernaut of APS and community effort to now leave one school 11% under capacity while we still have a deficit of 250 middle school seats. It, that's not mission accomplished. I spoke at the last meeting of bringing forward an alternative proposal. I created one, but it did not get support from my colleagues. Bringing a losing propo proposal forward wastes staff resources and gets the community riled over late notice and lack of transparency. I, I don't like Williamsburg being set at 89% of capacity and I don't like the resulting demographics there with ratios of economically disadvantaged Latino and African American students that do not deliver the benefits of our core value, diversity. And there are other issues of alignment, enrollment, proximity and diversity in other locations that I would like to fix and that could be fixed if Williamsburg's seats were filled, thus giving other sites flexibility. <clears throat> but I need three votes to fix it, and I don't have that. I am voting for the superintendent's proposal, as amended with direction, for two reasons. <clears throat> Excuse me. First, by including direction to relook at boundaries comprehensively next year for possible refinements, we at least establish a path to bring about improvements that would not otherwise happen. Two, we're opening a new middle school, and this boundary proposal does largely create a boundary at that school and adjusts boundaries elsewhere. I'm enough of a pragmatist to understand a boundary change has to happen. Uh, I wanna speak now to the community members who have taken the time to write, speak, and meet, meet with me about how this process touches them. I truly do understand the attachment to and desire for walkability, connection with peer cohorts, and neighborhood cohesion. They're all the same issues I had as a parent of school-aged children, and, and indeed every parent does at every moment in time. I, I get it. However, I can't build a boundary plan based on what works well for each student and each family. I, I have to take a top-down approach <clears throat> based on what is best for the school system as a whole and have those positive effects roll to schools, families, and students. Finally, I fear a dangerous precedent being set today and one that has real implications for community equity and instructional quality. The geographic placement and the different capacities of our schools mitigate against an evenly distributed boundary or feeder system. If we elevate our six considerations to top priority, if we leave, <clears throat> excuse me, if we leave Williamsburg that far under capacity, in every future boundary change, we will have to contend with neighborhoods and school communities saying, leave us under capacity too. You did it for Williamsburg, we want it too. That's not how to run a railroad. In the final analysis, what matters most, the only thing really, the one thing we're in business to do is what happens in the classroom. <clears throat> That's why people are seeking out our school system in record numbers, why you all are here today, to make the public school system you've invested in better, why you're not fleeing to private school or moving out of Arlington, why we're a top-ranked school system, one of the best in the nation. What matters most is the instruction that high quality staff delivers in the classroom. Instruction that yields successful outcomes for our students. The classroom is the top priority. After that, figuring out how to get there is secondary. Thank you.
Thank you. Mr. Lento? I just want to take a moment to um, thank our staff for the hard work that they, uh, the hard work that they did this in this process. Um, the community engagement, the level of detail, the level of engagement uh, with not just us, um, staff, the way they worked with, just really the whole community, the whole system is really commendable. So thank you, Ms. Stengel and your staff for all the hard work and um, the endless nights that you had and the diligence in answering our questions. Uh, and it was so difficult for them because what you have on this dais is a true representation of your community. I philosophically disagree with Mr. Goldstein and we regularly have that discussion. And I have community members who fully agree with me and community members who philosophically disagree with me and agree with Mr. Goldstein. And that is a great thing that when we are making these kinds of decisions in the community, that you truly have representation community-wide. And you have that. Trust me, because all five of us bring such a different perspective to this discussion. Um, we have all received your emails. Thank you so much for reaching out to us and sharing your perspective. Without you telling us where you are, what your concerns are, how these decisions affect your community, we cannot know. We are five people and we cannot cover 26.2 square miles um, when we have to make these decisions, but we try. Um, and so that being said, uh, I apologize if I haven't been able to respond to the emails that were sent to me, but I did read them. It's been a very um, busy time with the holidays, with middle school boundaries, with community processes. So I, I do want to apologize for that. I also want to explain a little bit about where I am with uh, the motion. I think that we are in a very good place and I am going to be voting for this motion and I did not look at Williamsburg being under capacity as something that is a done deal. I voted in this motion because I think that it truly represents the values of our community and provides a great opportunity for Williamsburg to have an option or choice program um, something that can bring diversity to that school and uh, provide another option for families that maybe can't reach programs on the other side of the county. Um, our schools in central Arlington take a lot of our burden trying to be a central location. And we have families that are willing to travel to Gunston for immersion. We have families that travel all the way from the south to HB Woodlawn for the HB Woodlawn program. It's their choice. That is the beauty. It's their choice. They look at their family dynamics. They mitigate their transportation challenges. They understand what sacrifices they're going to make and find ways to balance that in their family to make those choices. So I want to provide more choices for our community. But I do not believe that in forcing communities to not have that choice is the right way to do that, to promote demographic diversity. And we talk about economically disadvantaged students, but then we also bring race into it. And so I think that reality is, is that those are two in the same conversations and we need to face that. And again, I respect my community members who do not agree with me. I understand where you're coming from, but we just have philosophical differences on how this moves forward. And the things that I want to remind us as we look at this is, when you have families who are economically disadvantaged, so I'm not gonna talk about race, I'm gonna talk about economically disadvantaged because diversity comes in a lot of different forms. We do not have a public transportation system in North Arlington that supports families of low income who need to leave work to pick up their sick child at a school. I know families who have had their kids waiting for hours to get picked up because they don't have the ability to get to that school easily. These are families that live in the Williamsburg Island. I know families that get home at 6.30 or 7, and they only have one car. 
and their other spouse is using that car, so they can't get to that assembly or that performance at night to see their child because they're not going to make it on time. Because we don't have a public transit system that supports that situation. Community and support system that you create with your neighbors, that also is just as important, if not more so, than demographic diversity. Because you can choose to find diversity where you go. I grew up in very diverse communities. I grew up in very non-diverse communities. But when I entered the real world, I got to choose where I went and where I sought diversity. Or if I chose not to seek diversity. That is your choice. That is what makes this country so freaking amazing. So again, I respect the conversation. It is necessary. I think that here in APS, we truly, truly work very hard to educate our students where they are, regardless. And you have heard me say that. We educate them where we, they are, regardless. It doesn't matter where they come from um, or what they do. So to wrap that up, because I know that my other school boards have, school board colleagues have comments, and I apologize for the length of this. Um, uh, Please know that this has not been an easy decision for us. We recognize the challenges that some of our families will be facing, the concerns that have been brought to us. We are really hoping that the direction we provide um, to our superintendent will open transfers so those families that aren't um, happy with the process have the ability to transfer to another school. We are really looking on how to maximize our facilities um, and, and looking for programs and, and choices to put in Williamsburg and any other schools that may need to be um, accommodated. So thank you for your patience and for your understanding and for your advocacy in this process. Thank you, Mr. Lento. Ms. Van Doren. Thank you, Dr. Cannon. And, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here this evening. And I'm, we're very close to taking this vote. I'll be very, I'll try to be quick because a lot of my colleagues have commented on a lot of the same topics that I will address. First of all, I'm going to thank staff again. We have come a long way. My, one of my first votes on the school board, Dr. Ken and I both voted on some of the boundary refinements related to the Discovery School, and I think we had something like 20 options at that point. There was some huge number of options. Then uh, the next time around, we did the high school, and we had maybe six. This time, we had really two uh, options, and I think the process that we went through was much improved and that we front loaded it with um, making sure our policies were uh, up to date and then getting uh, community input uh, based on those policies and then moving forward to refine that. The other piece of the um, uh, process that I want to applaud is the way in which we had the feedback go directly to staff rather than through the school board to the staff. I think that worked extremely well because by the time the school board in many instances saw the collection of uh, input, the staff had already addressed them. And I just wanted to, to bring these, these books, which the board did review all of, um, all the correspondence that I want you to see. All of this was read, digested, and in every instance possible responded to by our staff. Uh, and it happened in real time. And then to the extent that we could, each of us read these as quickly as we could, we did. So we really were doing a, uh, a feedback loop that was quick and I think extremely efficient and it worked. And we addressed people's concerns and needs as quickly and as best we could. And I have to thank the staff for that. I think we're getting better and better at this. And hopefully we'll be really good at it and won't need it anymore. And that leads me uh, to my next point. Um, I've become a real fan of the uh, play Hamilton. I, I, I just, I drive my uh, colleagues nuts because they're little songs that play in the back of my mind and various things that we're doing. But one thing that our founding fathers did was create documents that endured and that endured even in this age. And if I don't mean to draw too close an analogy to our policies, but some of our policies have endured for decades, and we did update our boundary policy and our options and transfer policy, and we did update them to fit the times. And one of the times that we're in for the paradigm shift that I want to talk about is that we are no longer at an under-capacity school system. We are at an at 
if not verging it above capacity school system. So there are different tools which are alluded to in these policies that we need to use differently. And I think we all have to start really thinking about our schools in a different way. We are going to be at capacity. We are going to have to optimize capacity, which has to do with common space and using relocatables flexibly. We have a lot of relocatables and as we shift kids out of Williamsburg and Swanson, we're going to have a lot of relocatables. And we already own them. And we have budget issues coming up. We need to think flexibly. And I have yet to meet students or teachers who are in relocatables who tell me they can't stand being there. What I usually hear is that the teachers are vying to be in them. The kids think they're kind of cool to be in. And they just work. Do we all want them to have them all the time? No. Are they a tool? Yes. Are they awful nice? Uh, if you haven't been in a relocatable, be in one. They're, they're kind of like to have one outside the back of my house. Um, <laughs> got six people in a small house. Um, but here's my point is the paradigm shift of rather than presuming all the time that all of our schools have to be exactly the same with exactly the same level of enrollment, our schools are going to be different. It's going to be based on what that school can accommodate, and it's not going to be the same everywhere. Dr. Murphy, without even coming to the school board, has the option of moving programs and, uh, and, and moving things around so that he can balance enrollment, or the staff can. That can be done with preschool programs, with Montessori satellite programs, with interlude programs. There are a variety of programs that can be moved around. So I mention that because there are tools for balancing enrollment. But again, I go back to the point of every single school doesn't have to be the same. If the school works and the focus is on the classroom and the focus is on the excellent education our kids get and on our teachers, we're going to be fine. And every school is not going to be the same. They're just not. And we need to, I think, shift our minds away from thinking the same everywhere to what, how do you optimize each school with the best possible environment and the best possible educational experience for the kids? Uh, that, I think, is where we need to go. And we have one school at one population level and another school at another with the tool in uh, our superintendent's hands to equalize that to make sure it's the best experience it can possibly be. So I'm not looking for the same everywhere. I'm looking for what's best for our kids everywhere. And that, obviously, will differ a bit as uh, Ms. Talento addressed. All right, so tonight's motion, I'm going to support that. I have three areas that I think our staff struggled to address, and that is East Falls Church, the Abingdon area, and the Boulevard Manor area. I hope that in the uh, flexible guidance and direction that we're going to be giving the superintendent, we can come around to addressing those areas. I wish that we'd be able to do more, but we couldn't. But I know that as one board member, I'm going to be watching very closely to see that we're able to address those. And uh, I remember a, a tea bag um, saying that I keep, and that is performance is preferred over promises. Um, I am going to hold myself accountable to making sure that to the extent we can, we can address these areas that we know coming out of any policy or any boundary change that we have, that we come back and make sure that we've addressed the issues that we haven't quite nailed at that point. So as I said, for me, um, what came out of these letters are a focus on community and proximity as one of the six considerations we had, but an overwhelming one that came through loud and clear, a gratitude for the transparency and the community engagement we had. But what we need now is a system that's flexible, one that is different perhaps from place to place in terms of population and balance and the use of relocatables. Those are the way I think we have to start looking at capacity and the over over arching term for me is flexibility and uh, community. Those are the two that, that ride out for me uh, as we go forward. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, I will add on to the great praise um, to our staff, Ms. Stengel, um, your, you and your team. Um, I think it's very rare in this community that we have unanimity, uh, rare to have board unanimity. unanimity um, but it is clear that everyone thought you guys did an amazing job. Even if they don't, aren't, it's not their favorite outcome in terms of the actual map, the praise for you has been just absolutely um, 
pervasive in this community. Everyone has, has been very happy with how you work. Ms. Stengel, thank you. I see your team over there. Ms. Carrillo's there. Ms. Mimberg, Ms. Tosillo, Ms. Johnson. Um, and you know, on top of that, the entire, did I get, did I get your team? What's that? Yeah, Ms. Carrillo, I said, yeah, Gladys. Yeah, oh, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I thought, oh. Um, and on top of that, the entire executive leadership team, I know, has been deeply engaged. Our ambassadors out in the schools, um, but you know, the, the yeah, there's some ambassadors are here, yay. Um, the entire ELT has been deeply engaged in this and contributed in so many ways as well. And of course, Dr. Murphy, um, it's really, really been a tremendous effort um, on the part of on the part of so many. Really, really appreciate it. Want to thank the community um, for being so engaged and continuing to come out. And um, you know, it, it, as as was said earlier, people leave their kids at home to come out and engage and advocate and share. And you know, the dialogue. It's this is. This is what keeps a healthy community. If we can, if we can continue to, to converse, raise issues, dialogue, and, um, and I know that we'll continue to do that going forward. I really, really want to thank my board colleagues. Um, it is, boundary decisions are difficult. And um, listening to the community, not being able to help everyone who advocates is, is difficult and, and even painful for board members. And um, yet, never once did I hear a single board member waver on the commitment to get this job done. It's important for the community as we go forward and build our buildings to have the boundaries in place and ready to go. And I really, really am thankful to everyone for always being committed to continuing to work on this, not saying, you know, we can put it off or, you know, it's, it's too hard. Everyone was, was fully committed to this. and that. That really means a lot, and um, you know it's it's been tremendously hard. And I know everyone's going to have nice holidays after this, um, getting through this process. Um, I just want to summarize, as as kind of has been hinted, as as people have made comments, you know this um, where we are is um, a way to move forward, a path forward um, that was put together by five board members who have, you know, kind of different senses of. The, the pros and the cons and what, what we do and don't like about, about where we are. Um, the staff proposal is pretty good. And um, I think it was said earlier, there may be things that you know, different people might want to change, but the problem is there are many criteria, there are many neighborhoods, many schools, and the fact is you can't get them all lined up so that everyone feels it's perfect. And, th and that's a simple fact. But, we're, but, but, it's, but it's, a good, it's a good map and um, and, and so we're moving forward with that. However, uh, there are several things that people wanted, board members felt um, we needed to continue to look at. One is the utilization. Program moves, potential new programs. We are asking the superintendent, directing the superintendent to bring these ideas and, um, and proposals to us. That's important. We are we are um, acknowledging that we may need options as we get more data, as elementary boundaries are completed. We may want to make some refinements to this plan. The word refinement was carefully chosen. We did not say we want to do another boundary change process. We said refinement, which is a small adjustment um, to address issues. So we left that option open so that we will and we can come back um, to this map and, and, and look at some potential refinements or, or, or tweaks. Finally, um, I'm not sure um, any of my colleagues mentioned the, the item on the bottom, which is, is a very important piece of this. We've heard from people about concerns about their kids, a school that they feel strongly is the right one or the wrong one. We hear year round, every year, about p for different reasons that families feel strongly about schools. Um, and it could be for a variety of reasons. Um, and it's always been a priority of this board that we have as many options available to families as possible for transfers. Uh, so we are asking the superintendent, we are, we are directing the superintendent to develop a plan to enable transfers at all middle schools. We don't have that now. We hope we can have it by the time this boundary change um, takes place. The point of the boundary change is it is going to balance uh, enrollment much better than it is today. 
and our hope is that that is going to put some flexibility back into our system. These are our hopes. Um, we will continue to work on this. It, I'm sure you guys will be engaging with us and we'll continue to dialogue. Uh, we will continue the hard work. Um, so um, I hope everyone does have a nice holiday, but we will definitely be um, talking and working probably straight through it and right on into the new year. We look forward to working with you all. Some of us, I won't be Yeah, okay, thank you, Mr. Lander, good point. Um, yeah, but, but, but you're gonna watch the Super Bowl, right? Absolutely. Absolutely, okay, with that, I think, I, I, board colleagues, shall we vote? Um, all in favor of the motion as presented by Mr. Lander, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion uh, passes five to zero. Uh, should we? Yeah, yeah I, I think that, these next yeah, items might be. Let's, we have legislative packages. Yeah, yeah, we're going to we're going to we're going to go on through and uh, recognizing that that um, you know uh, folks may need to take um, breaks at times. But let's go right on to our next action item, which is our legislative package. Mr. Lander, as the board legislative liaison, would you like to introduce this item? Yes, as, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. As uh, Ms. Wise makes her way uh, uh, confidently to the podium, I'd like to thank her for her uh, wisdom, her advocacy down in Richmond, and her partnership uh, over the years. For those of uh, uh, who are not familiar, Ms. Lola Wise is our um, uh, Arlington, Alexandria City, and, and, and Falls Church um, lobbyists down in, in Richmond on legislative issues and uh, creating the balance between our state lawmakers and our local jurisdictions um, has been very challenging over the last eight years, especially when we've had uh, leadership that wasn't always in line, in alignment with where our local jurisdictions are. Um, uh, uh, my uh, and I said this at our legislative breakfast, my recommendation to my colleagues is to uh, stand next to Ms. Lilla Wise and allow her to do her thing. That is the easiest way to get the most done, and she does a great job. Uh, we don't have uh, dinner any longer down in Richmond once a year like we used to with our legislators, but the breakfast is an opportunity They're to really get caught up to date on the package prior to the session that begins in January. I wanna thank you for helping me these past eight years. You are a thrill to work with. So thank, thank you, you. Lilla. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening. The legislative package is pretty much the same as you've seen it with the addition of two items. And uh, these were uh, added because uh, these were things that the Virginia School Boards Association felt were really very important. And so we wanted to support that in, in our own uh, package. The first one is religious exemptions. And this is the Arlington Board supports amending the code to affirm that annual certification is required by students and their parents for religious exemption from compulsory attendance. As you all probably know, it is possible for parents to say, we want to um, exempt our children from going to school. And they fill out forms for religious exemptions. But before, you could fill out one form and then you, you know, that was it for the whole time you were in school. And so what we're looking at is to have some more accountability, make sure that the kids really are getting some sort of education, homeschooling or whatever. And uh, so that is why this uh, is here. The other one, and this is one that's certainly going to be a lot more controversial, is guns at school activities. And as you know, for most school activities, guns are already prohibited. What this is talking about is activities that uh, are not within the school building or on school grounds. And an example of that, for example, might be uh, the prom, where it's a school activity and yet it might be someplace else. So other than that, this is, uh, these are the issues as uh, Mr. Landard uh, brought out. General Assembly starts the 13th of January. So we'll be quite busy before we get going. Uh, it's, this year is a long session, which means two things. One, it's eight week session, but the other is it's a budget session. So I'll be looking tomorrow to see what the governor's budget looks like 
Um, and it's going to be a pretty interesting year with a lot of, of new legislators. Uh, seniority is not going to be the same as it's been before. Uh, we may even be in a position where we can have some bipartisan working together and get something done. So uh, it's going to be a very interesting session. And I would like to pile on <laughs> with everybody else about what a joy it's been to work for Mr. Landers. And he said, tell, tell them what you said about when you were a naval officer. What did they tell you about being a leader? And he has done exactly that. I don't, I'm not necessarily saying I'm the good people, but he gets, <laughs> but he. I'm saying you're good people. Okay. It, it, as but, I said, it makes it easier when you get out of the it's, way. It's been wonderful to work with someone, no micromanaging, and yet he was always there when I needed an answer. Are we going to go with this or aren't we going to go with this? So uh, it's been a delight to work with you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. And uh, Ms. Elliott, do we have? Oh, yeah. Do we have speakers? I speak. Um, board colleagues. Uh, I have a motion, any? Madam Chair. Okay. There we go. I move that the board wholeheartedly support <laughs> the and approve the 2018 legislative package. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Fre freaking aye. What's that? Freaking aye. I had to say freaking aye. <laughs> Any opposed? Motion carries five to zero. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Wise. Have a yeah. wonderful session. We look Thank forward you. to hearing how it goes. Happy yes. holidays. And if any of you have an opportunity to come to Richmond just for the day or if you're there for VSBA, I'd be glad to have you come with me and see some of the things that, uh, that we do. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It will be very interesting this year. Very interesting. Uh, okay. Let's go on to our third action item, which is uh, summer school fees. Dr. Murphy, is there additional information on this item? I don't believe there's any additional information at this time. Okay, and do we have speakers? No speakers, how about a motion? Um, Madam Chair, I move that the board approve the 2018 summer school fees. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Aye, any opposed? Motion passes five to zero. keep sort of expecting applause. I don't know why. I'm like, yay, we passed something. <laughs> um, yeah. Our final action item is for the Gunston Supplementary Heating Work and Controls. Dr. Murphy, is there any additional information on this item? Yes. Uh, we actually heard this item at an earlier board meeting as an information item. I know the school board had some questions in regards to this item, so we'd like to bring it back this evening and do a very brief presentation uh, with uh, Mr. Jim Meekle and Ms. Leslie Peterson to give the board an update and also answer questions that were posed as an information item, and then I think we're ready to move forward with this. Good evening. Um, I want to take the opportunity to jump on the uh, James Landers bandwagon. Thank you very much, <laughs> especially for the efforts uh, with the Facility Advisory Committee. And thank you for my shirt. You know I'm aware of that. I can't wait to wear that. Don't tell everybody. So we're back again with the Gunston um, supplementary heating work. Um, the, this piece hasn't changed at all. We're asking for a further 300,000 to do some uh, to get some heating work completed now that we, we really desperately need um, to get started on as soon as possible. Um, I think you'd ask for a summary of where we are. So in the pre-phases so far, we've spent 685,000. We've uh, committed 574,000 to design. And so this would be another 300,000 on top of that. Um, and that is to get the boilers fully functional. And with the weather changing, that's something we, we would love to start as early as next week. Uh, the last piece um, is we ask you for that and we're kind of leading forward and Ms. Pearson may have something to add. Um, we still don't have final estimates for the whole project so we will be coming back to you with a much um, a more comprehensive explanation of that uh, in due course. Leslie. You said it well. Let me ask for speakers, speakers first. Um, okay. Uh, do we have any speakers? 
Okay. Um, board clarifying questions, colleagues? I just questions? have Ms. Van Doren. two clarifying questions. One is, is there a total budget? Are we over budget, and is there a total budget for this? There's not a total budget yet because we're still in design work for the entire project. What we need to do right now is get these Gunston boilers done so that the Gunston students and staff have heat this winter. We can't not, if we don't do this work, they won't have heat. When the final design project does come forward, the total budget for that project will include work that has already been done and we'll show you what other work needs to be done after that. So this was not a planned project, it's a project that simply happened and that we don't have a budget for and we're doing it as we go along? It, it would have been part of the overall total project, but because the boilers have failed more uh, quickly than we had anticipated, we need to do this work now and not wait for the full and design. So we don't have an overall budget? We don't for oh, the yeah. project at this point. And it's when still in design. will we? Um, we would expect that, let's say, within about um, a month, I would say, based on conversations with the engineers. And um, that will then become part of the CIP? No, that, that, the funds for that have already been um, allocated to the HVAC project. How much money has been allocated then to it? In, in the sense that we don't, have, we don't do this the same way as we do major construction projects, we have um, bond funds set aside for HVAC roofing and infrastructure projects. Mm -hmm. Once we put together the budget for that, we will come to you and say, we need to do this project, we need these funds for that. Because we don't have that project put together yet, we haven't come to you for those funds. What we're doing is coming to you for this $300,000 worth. I understand it has to be done and I'm now going into a comment section. I understand it has to get done and I'm in no way gonna get in the middle of it, but it is uncomfortable approving things bit by bit without an overall project. And without an overall project it tells me it's within a budget when I know we have more projects that we need to do than we have funds. This is very, very important, it has to be done, but we have more than what needs, we have more projects than we have funds for and we have more capital projects than we have funds for, Correct. and it's only gonna become exacerbated as prices continue to go up. So I'm simply, this is the first time I think I've ever seen an item where we are approving something bit by bit by bit without an overall budget and without an overall plan, and I would like to know when it's going to come back with an overall plan so we can see this within the scope so we then know the impact on other budgets later on then that's not to say that I don't think we absolutely have to do this. Yes. And we agree with you. Um, and as I said, this if the boilers hadn't failed now, you would have right. seen this as part of the overall project when the design was finished and we brought it to you in January, February so of 2018. I think that's great that we so rarely have this kind of situation and that we're dealing with it. My other question is, Gunston is a joint use facility is the county involved in any way with the overall funding? I remember when Mr. Meekle and I went through a lot of this at Jefferson, there were parts of the HVAC system that were shared. Is any of this expense gonna be shared with the county? I'd have to turn to Mr. Meekle for that. Yeah, so on the HVAC here, no. Uh, mostly the fields, we have a memorandum of understanding for fields and gyms and so forth. This is on us at the moment. Now we are gonna do a review of all the MOUs and this is the kind of thing I guess we would revisit. But this HVAC system also covers the uh, community portion of Gunston? Correct. Madam Chair, I'd ask that would this be a conversation point with the county board because we are uh, taking the entire cost for this put it project. On, the, on our leadership yeah. agenda, sure. Okay. Um, any other clarifying questions before we go to a motion? Yes, Mr. Goldstein. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I guess I didn't really appreciate, I want to pick up on some of Nancy's comments, I didn't really appreciate this when it came as an uh, info item. We have to do work now in order to assure heat in the building for the winter. That work that we want to do now, that you're asking for the funding to do now, um, is that going to be 
replaced, you, you know, thrown out or, or superseded by, by the project that we don't have a complete design for no, yet? No, it's part of that project that we're being forced to do before the whole project because of the circumstance right now. So that money, in, in other words, will be deducted out of the total project cost once we establish it. So this is, this is not r repair work. This is a piece of the new project that's going to be done first before we know really, before we really see a complete plan and budget for the complete project. Correct. But we know we need this first step done. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. Shall we, uh, we need a motion. Okay. I move yes. that the board approve the, I'm sorry. Yes. Madam Chair. I move that the board approve the allocation of up to $300,000 in additional HVAC bond funding for work in advance of the main project for Gunston's supplementary heating work and controls. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have one final item tonight, and it is an information item, the FY 2017 final fiscal status report. Dr. Murphy. Let me uh, turn back to uh, Ms. Peterson, you are hearing the final fiscal status report for FY 2017 this evening. Uh, we are going to bring this back on January the 18th. Uh, we are going to skip a meeting, and this is a practice that we put in place with closeout. This will allow um, the uh, Budget Advisory Committee to the school board to have some time to process and to weigh in, and we found that to be very helpful and informative before we come back then on the 18th. So, Ms. Peterson, I'll have you go ahead and uh, review some of the recommendations we have and the financial statements. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Tonight we are going to review the financial results of FY 2017. Uh, in the first part of the presentation, we'll talk about the um, recommendations for allocating balances that remain after the fiscal year closeout after which I will take questions. And then the second part, we'll review the CIP closeout, and then I'll take questions after that. FY 2017 ended June 30th, and all the data that we present tonight are as of this, at that date. Closeout is essentially an accounting activity required to close the books for the fiscal year. The auditors have come and gone, and APS has received an unqualified audit opinion on the financial statements, as we do every year. We've also filed the state annual school report. The details on closeout are in the memorandum and attachments provided to the school board last week and posted on board docs. Tonight I will summarize the highlights of these closeout documents. The memorandum that was sent to the board provides a fund by fund analysis um, to show you how we arrived at the results. These charts are intended to summarize and display by fund how revenue and expenditures came in compared with budget and what the fund's ending balance was. This chart shows the results of the four funds where ending balances are available to be reallocated. APS had an ending balance of $13.6 million available from operations at the end of FY 2017. These three funds are those where ending balances are retained and carried forward. The majority of the ending balance is in the capital projects fund due to long-term planning, planning and implementation cycles. The ending balance in grants is due to timing, usually due to the differences between our fiscal year, which ends June 30th, and the federal fiscal year. All of these balances are carried forward for appropriation in the appropriate fund. As part of revenue sharing, APS shares in the county's local tax revenue that comes in over budget in the same proportion that it received or the original revenue, or in this case, 46.6%. APS is also required to contribute to the county's general fund reserve, which maintains a reserve totaling 5% of total county expenditures, including schools. So for APS, this contribution represented $1.3 million. The remaining portion of $4.5 million is available to the school board in ending balance. 
So in summary, we have $18.1 million available to be reallocated, 13.6 savings from operations from APS, and $4.5 million in additional revenue from the county. Next up are our recommendations for reallocation of those uh, available funds. As we did at closeout last year, we are recommending setting aside a portion of the funds and reserves, specifically in the capital reserve, the compensation reserve, and the debt service reserve, so we can replenish those funds. And that totals $14.4 million. In addition, we have some expenditure recommendations to allocate $3.7 million for one-time expenditures in FY 2018. This includes instructional resources based on the adoption recommendations from FY17. Uh, funding for program management, project planning, and transportation planning. Funding to begin replacing aging wireless access points throughout the school division. And additional buildings and grounds maintenance needs primarily. And then there are some other um, smaller items on there, including some professional development, including diversity training, and then um, a study of planning factors and technology. In summary, um, the recommended allocations are to provide $6 million to the compensation reserve, $6.4 million to the capital reserve, $2 million to the debt service reserve, and $3.7 million to current year requirements. Any questions on the first part? This is the first part only, so this is the we're first just part only. Uh, questions, board colleagues? Ms. Talento. Um, so for the, I'm going to slide, sorry, I'm looking for the slide. Ms. Peterson, I apologize. It's okay. Maybe you know it off the top of your head. It's the slide that shows the total um, capital reserve balance, the 38 point. That's coming up. That's in the second part. Oh, no, the 38.3, the capital reserve, is slide seven? That's in the second part. It this is? is just okay. the first I'm so part. sorry. I thought I, That's okay. I thought I was following you. Okay, I apologize. It's all right. Ms. Peterson, um, our, our clerk is not here, but if we have, oh, um, do we want to do speakers? We're sort of, we did the first half of the presentation. Do we want to do speakers on the first half, or do we want to wait until the presentation is over? Shall, uh, is it, which part is it on? This first part. Do you all want to have, do you all want to take a speaker on this section or you want to just finish the presentation? Shall, let, let's, let's do the speaker because it might really lead to questions on this part, so. All right, our speaker is Mr. Josh Fold. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Josh Fold. This time my hat is with the Arlington Education Association's Compensation Committee. Um, many years ago, before most of you were on this board, the step was denied to your employees, citing the cost, yet laptops and iPads appeared in the schools. I am not here to debate the past, but know at that time trust was destroyed and morale went into the tank. Slowly, through fair actions by proceeding boards, trust has built back up. A compensation reserve was created and the step policy was revised. Fast forward to today and in the current budget discussions, the step increase, currently tagged at an unbelievable $9.7 million, is dangled as a main driver of the budget gap. Your employees again get nervous as 2012 flashes in their heads. The memory of lost wages is not soon forgotten. The Arlington Education Association continues to dispute the cost of the step as there is always lapse in turnover that must be paired with it to determine a true calculation. Turnover is perhaps the most steady source of funding, one time or ongoing, that APS can count on. But for tonight, I will accept the 9.7 million to make my point. It is not lost on the 1,800 members of the Arlington Education Association that the proposal tonight for six million to be moved to the compensation reserve to help pay for next year's step but the remaining 3.7 needed is being allocated to things that, while I am sure are worthy, will barely receive three weeks worth of scrutiny. The optics are concerning at best. Don't get me wrong, I am ecstatic 
and grateful and frankly never thought I'd see that we are moving $6 billion to help pay for the step. But let's pay our employees first. Let's fund the compensation reserve to whatever level is necessary so that we can take the step increase out of the budget discussion for 2019. Okay, thank you. And let's go back to um, board uh, colleagues. Do you have any questions or comments on the first half of the presentation? Mr. Goldstein. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, we, uh, you didn't, I don't think you had this in the presentation, but um, you've said that the um, step increase is going to cost 9.7. That's not dollars. in the presentation because that's the estimate of the step for FY19. Okay, 9.7. And the recommendation is to put uh, six million in the compensation reserve. Correct. There's uh, approximately four point six million in there currently. Four point six million currently. Mm -hmm. So adding six is going to take us over what we what we would need to fund that step over the nine point seven. What the compensation what the recommendation to add to the compensation reserve will do is put the compensation reserve over $10 million. It has been the school board's practice in every year that we've used reserves to only use half of the needed increase in reserves. So we would not use all $10 million for the step increase. We would only use what we needed to offset half of that. Okay. And the um, policy was changed a couple years ago to direct the superintendent to bring a step increase in the budget? Yes, to include a step increase in his proposed budget. And so how are you planning to, if you're recommending that we use half of what's in the reserve, the compensation reserve, how are you planning to fund the rest? From ongoing funding in the budget. Again, I, I'd like to jump in here because I, I think we're we're um, we're making a lot of decisions that have yet to be made. That may be a, a good way to couch it. We established the compensation reserve because we were challenged in previous years to come up with all of the funding to be able to uh, support a step. So this was a measure taken to begin to have a reserve fund and to draw on that reserve fund. And it just so happens in the past that has been set up that we take approximately 50%, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. So tonight, what we're saying, based on what the closeout is and being fiscally prudent, I'm recommending that we take this portion of the closeout and move it forward to the reserve. All the other pending discussions about the amount of the step increase, how much we'll draw from the reserve, those are decisions that will be forthcoming. As I made mention earlier this evening about the budget, we'll find out a whole bunch of information by noon tomorrow because we'll get the governor's budget. And then there will be progressive points of information that we will learn as we move through the first part of the year. The next watermark will be what we hear from uh, the county with local revenue. So I just caution us from making, you know, sort of uh, decisions here this evening. Right now, the only decision really before us is I'm recommending we take $6 million out of closeout and we put it into the compensation reserve in preparing for what my budget recommendation will be on February 22nd. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, board colleagues, other questions? You got to decide if you have a follow up. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I'll, well, I'll, um, I'll follow up on this in our two by twos next week. Okay. Or if you think of it, Thank you. we've got the second half of the presentation too. So, okay. Let's carry forward. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. 
So this part of the presentation will focus on the fourth quarter of the CIP, which is the final report of the year. Again, more detailed information was provided to the school board and is on board docs, and I'm just going to highlight some of the results uh, and the status of the CIP at the end of the and at the end of FY 2017. Um, this slide is a high-level summary of the budget and balance in the capital major construction and minor construction major maintenance budgets. As a reminder, the major construction is multi-year projects with multi-year budgets, usually over $500,000, and the minor construction major maintenance is uh, typically budgeted for one year and is completed within that year. Under the major construction category, we have 13 projects that are ongoing. Um, since the last report, we have completed and removed from the report the Ashlawn and Wakefield projects, and we've added bond from funds from the spring sale to the Career Center, Fleet, and the HVAC roofing and infrastructure projects. At closeout, the CIP reserves um, we have capital reserve of $31.9 million and major construction reserve of $0.6 million. And that is, uh, the capital reserve figure is before any recommended allocations from this uh, report. At the end of the fourth quarter, as I indicated, we've completed the Ashlawn and, and Wakefield projects and we've completed 129 of the 165 projects that were identified through FY 2017 or 78%. The remainder of them were completed um, this summer or early fall. And questions? Okay. Uh, any speakers? No. Board colleagues, questions, comments? Anyone? Ms. Talento. Ms. Peterson, could you explain to me the difference between um, our capital reserve fund and our major project? Uh, sure. The major, major construction, construction reserve, reserve. Capital uh, reserve. Thank sure. you. Sure. The major construction reserve. I'll go back to that so you can look at it. The major construction reserve is something that predates our capital reserve, and it was a small reserve that we had uh, in place so that when a project was completed and had a little bit of leftover money, we would put it into the reserve. If a project needed a little bit of extra money because it had gone over budget, we would come to the board and then we'd move money from, from there into the project. So it was kind of that catch-all of, of things that were over and under. Then the board decided in it um, to stash away some funds specifically for construction and capital planning for the, the looming enrollment growth, and that reserve became part of the school board strategy to provide funding for construction. And those funds are separate and um, are used specifically for, for new projects or um, uh, other things that come up during, during the year. Okay, that's very helpful. So I just wanna make sure I have an understanding so we're still using our major construction reserve for the projects that may have some a little bit of leftover projects that have a little bit of overage. Correct. But our capital reserve is really what we're putting in for a new project for any unforeseen expenditures where we might not be able to sell a bond or we may need extra money. And right. it's really just thinking for the future, specifically for a focus on enrollment growth and having to build or um, come up with seats for our students or right. any other capital project that is significant and Future focus. Right. Thank you. That's very helpful. Anyone else? Mr. Goldstein. Thank you. Can you, I, I didn't get the slide number. Can you go back to the one with the list of all the schools? That one? Yeah, thanks. And can you walk me through that again? So this is, um, is this the MCMM? No, this is our major construction. These are our major construction projects. These are the very large projects that are the multi-year projects whose budgets span multiple years. So for example, we have the Fleet Elementary project on there, the Secondary Seats TBD project, uh, the Washington Lee Space Conversion. Those are the big projects. And, and all of these came or um, were identified and approved in the CIP? Uh, they were identified or approved in the CIP 
Yes. The, the one from uh, the last one. Yes, um, I would say except for the SIFAX office space project, which you approved separately from the CIP. Right, and that's not being, we're not using CIP, we're not using bond funds for that. Is that correct? We are not using bond funds for that. We used capital reserve funds. For okay, that. and so the budget column um, all reflects what was uh, identified in the CIP and then I can't read that next column. Expenditures uh, is the work that's proceeded on it since the project was identified. So the first column is the budget, the overall budget for the project, whether it's a one-year project or a multi-year project. So it's the total of that project. Then the second column is any expenditures or commitments. If we've encumbered funds for the project, for the project manager or for the con contractors, then that is listed there. And then the balance is what has not yet been obligated or encumbered. So for example, if I can read this properly, I'm sorry, and my contacts have decided to go bad. Um, we've added, we added funding from the um, spring bond sale for fleet and we've used a small portion of that to do construction so far so the balance um, right now is just over 20 million dollars but as we get going and more construction starts happening and we get the contractor the GMP in place then we will start encumbering a lot more of those funds so the the middle column will grow and the balance column will decrease. And remind me again, what's the secondary seats row? That's the secondary to? seats TBD. That's the design for that line in the CIP. It's just the design. Is there, there's nothing more that's going to be, nothing more from the CIP that's, that's in that? Secondary seats? Not uh, currently. Description? That's the only, the only bonds we sold were in the spring, and that was $5 million. We will sell more bonds next year, next spring, and more bonds in the years after that. So the budget column is bonds sold? Yes. Already? Yes. Okay. And since we don't sell bonds all the time, we don't sell all of the bonds all at once, what's the, aren't we missing a column here about the, the authorized amount total? There's a separate report in the documents that are on board docs and it's the bond report and it shows you exactly for each bond referendum how much was authorized, how much has been obligated, how much has been actually spent and what is left. No, I meant for this, uh, the far left column of schools, is there a, I guess, total project number first that this budget column then tells us how, there is, how much bond sales we've already incurred? There is, there is a total project budget for each one of these. Because this is a financial report, we're looking at it from the perspective of what have we put out there already? What have we spent? What do we have left? This is just one aspect of that report. We have other pieces to the whole CIP report that are um, detailed on board docs. Okay, so I guess I'm confused by the, by the word budget. Um, and that's really just bonds already sold. Yes. But there could be more. Like in that um, secondary seats row, there could be more. That that five million could be yes could we're be augmented. We're reporting this particular chart right here is reporting on the money that we have in hand, how we've used it, and what's left. There are other pieces of this overall report that give you the other parts of that. I see. And this is as of June 30th, 2017. And it's as of June 30th, 2017. If, if, 
If it would make things clearer, we could come back with a report that shows everything that you're asking for. It's going to be confusing because there's going to be a big number and there's going to be a smaller number and then there's going to be what's spent and then what's left. Let, let's maybe do this um, follow-up conversation. Um, we can work do that this, too. Get this worked out maybe during the two by two. All right, thank you. Okay, um, mm -hmm. yep. Ms. Lundin, did you have a follow-up all set? Everyone all set? I'm good. Okay, and, okay. Um, and we did get all the way through all parts we of the presentation. We are through all parts of it. Um, this hey. will come back to you for approval on January the 18th. We do skip the meeting, as Dr. Murphy said, so the BAC has right. time to review. Right, so we have lots of time to study the documents. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. You're and board, uh, board colleagues, is there any new business? Hearing none, we are adjourned. <laughs>